If you could please take your seats and settle in, we will start in a minute. So good morning, welcome back. Uh, I hope you had a very good day yesterday, both in the sessions, the plenaries, the breakouts, the informal sessions, the evening, very animated, maybe a little difficult to have a conversation, uh, but I hope many of you also extended that, uh, those informal conver conversations uh, uh, beyond and to, to other spaces. Um, yesterday we started with looking at knowledge, the knowledge commons, and knowledge as the way we understand the world, the way we give meaning, how it inspires and guides our action. Um, and uh, some discussions that were initiated in the morning continued, I know, in some of the parallel sessions on at least rethinking knowledge, if not decolonizing knowledge, important with the multidimensional crises that we heard about in the afternoon, that we also question how we approach knowledge, what we consider to be legitimate knowledge, how we generate it, whose knowledge, and these were the sets of questions and their implications for how we, as a community of researchers, generate, mobilize, contribute to, and, and use knowledge in our, uh, in our work, in our work as researchers, as teachers, and, and in our action and involvement with uh, our communities. Today, we're focused on the future, the futures, looking ahead, and we start with this first plenary session um, on reimagining our futures together, insights from futures literacy. Uh, we are delighted to have uh, uh, an exceptional set of speakers on the panel and very honored to have Assistant Director General uh, Gabriela Ramos, Assistant Director General for Social and Human Sciences, who will be leading the session and with no further ado, I give you the floor, Madam Edwidge. Thank you so much, and um, good morning, everybody. And, and and he's right. What a what a panel! Now I am about to chair. It's it's my pleasure, and it's also my pleasure to be with uh, with this uh, amazing gathering of chairs and uh, friends of uh, of UNESCO uh, in a session that I would say. Um, I'm an economist. I come from the economic world. Uh, human and social sciences uh, for me is core to the to the thinking, to the reflections that we need to address the many challenges we face. But then I found that in my sector we have this jewel, which is the futures foresight, futures literacy. I was not meant to be here with you, but I could escape some other engagements. So I'm, I'm very glad to join you. Uh, Christine Pfeiffer, who I ask you to, to stand so you can you can see her. She's the one that really want, was going to be here because she's the head of the futures and uh, foresight in my section. And so uh, you can uh, pass all the complaints to her, all the uh, uh, good comments to me, please. No, I'm kidding, Christine. It's great to have you there. Uh, this session, uh, as Sobi mentioned, is, is really important that we use all the tools we have in the scientific uh, um, toolkit uh, to try to come to better definitions of uh, where we want to be as a society, how do we handle the challenges that we're confronting, and, and how we can equip ourselves better, because this is all about equipping ourselves better. Uh, we are in a context of recurrent crisis, 2008, the financial crisis, the economic crisis, the COVID crisis, uh, the cost of living crisis linked to the war, um, the, the climate crisis, inequality crisis, and, and the fact is that we know that crisis exists. That's a fact of life, of history. The point is, how are we better prepared? 
how can we think about them how can we anticipate how can we dissect the elements of of this of this situation and 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 one of the powerful tools we have and this is something that i also learned here at unesco is imagining the future thinking about the future because we have actually something to do about building that future uh, using these capacities to anticipate but also using the tools and methodologies uh, and the and the kind of uh, of uh, reflections that we all do when we engage with foresight and when we engage with the futures uh, i've learned also that is not a future but futures in plural because it has to do with the many ways there are many options. The world is large, but the fact is that it's us and we that build those uh, futures. We also have the futures literacy, and, and uh, Christine has a team of very impressive uh, experts in this, because this is the, the, the capacity-led uh, approach in the sense that uh, we are the ones that can build the capacity to think about the future, but also, as you said, so we decolonizing our mindsets, opening the options, uh, looking at the things from different angles. And this is what we bring about with this uh, with this panel. We, we are very pleased because, as you know, Secretary General Guterres uh, launched our common agenda. And this is an amazing, if you, if you read the paper, you will agree with me, is one of the most inspiring propositions, because it's not only looking at what are the challenges and trying to have a common definition and a common narrative, which is important, but it's also trying to define a new social contract, a new way of measuring progress beyond GDP, a, a way of addressing climate change, a way to interact with futures and, and future generations. And we're going to have the summit in 2024 on the future generation. And UNESCO with this as, as usual, I said, we were not prepared, but uh, having been in the futures uh, world for so many years, we are co-leading the futures lab and the futures work in the UN system linked to the global to the common agenda with the UNDP and Global Pulse. And I'm, I'm happy that they will also be joining us. But now is the day of the chairs, is the day of our friends, uh, and is the day to show that you can help us build this uh, thinking and, and find uh, better answers because it's all about uh, better answers to build our agendas going forward. Uh, and I'm very pleased to, to welcome, we know each other, because the very first time I saw you, you told us that we should use humanities better. <laughs> and then you went into uh, looking at the open science and we have a fantastic recommendation, thanks to Portugal leadership when he was ambassador. And then of course, the futures of education. So you, you have a lot to tell us because we also need to confront with the real practitioners. Uh, how do we how do we advance our, our thinking? Lydia Garrido, uh, di director of Futures Laboratory Network of the South American Institute for Resilience and Sustainability Studies in Uruguay. Uh, welcome, Lydia. And, and great that would you and I are doing some of a gender balance. Not bad. This early in the morning. Uh, nothing wrong with boys. <laughs> we could do better. Yes. Uh, Martin uh, Kalman, director of executive. Um, an UNESCO Chair of Financial Anticipatory System Thinking at the Col de Pont Business School here in Paris. Welcome, uh, Martin. Uh, Julius uh, Gatun, Julius, that's the way I pronounce it well, UNESCO Chair of Anticipatory Social Technical Systems at Dedan Kimati University of Technology in Kenya. Social technical anticipatory, what a fantastic definition. And we have two UN colleagues, our dear friend Alexander Caldas. Uh, is he, he? No, it's there. You are there. Uh, uh, hello, Alex. Uh, in, in connection, Chief of Country Outreach, Technology and Innovation. Um, and this, uh, this is the branch in the science division of the UN Environmental Program. And this is good because we will, I mean, one of the most pressing challenges, if it is not the mother of the crisis, is the climate change. 
And then we have Chris Irnick, who is leading the UN Futures Lab Initiative, and we will be very uh, happy to hear with you um, what is up in the in the agenda. So let's just uh, start uh, without uh, any further ado. Uh, Lydia, you you and I we we spoke yesterday on on how to make it practical, how to make it accessible, how to make it usable, and um, and could you could you tell us how? And, and you're working with the parliament and and with all those people that need to take the right decision. Um, what motivated you to work on futures and? relying on futures and also um, what is the link between uh, these uh, methodologies tools to better decision making and outcomes so over to you please well Good morning, everybody. And first of all, thank you, UNESCO. Congratulations for this event and uh, my gratitude to you as the ADG for the SHS sector and to Futures Literacy team for the kind invitation to this panel and a kind sal salutation for uh, all the colleagues, authorities, cheers uh, here. Well, thank you very much for the provocation. And um, I will grasp it from Future Literacy Framework, a UNESCO initiative, um, which is a, a last generation knowledge for use in the future, and also a meta frame for broad making sense and sense making. And I will try to connect uh, the three uh, ideas, future with uh, resilience and also uh, decision making. Because uh, you talk about crisis and we could say that we are living in a time of poly crisis. So uh, the three uh, concepts, future resilience and decision making, practical decision making, taking into account the future are really essential. And um, well, I will start with some precisions. Um, for, uh, let's start with the uh, future. The future itself doesn't exist. Otherwise, it wouldn't be future. Instead, it would be present or past. There are past futures, and it is also an interesting exercise to explore how they were imagined and used. I used to provoke reflection showing a series of postcards collection that were designed in the late of the 19th century for a context of imagining the 2000. It's very interesting how the technological advance they imagine were uh, have an extraordinary accuracy, but instead, social, cultural, economical aspects with a projection on the values and meanings prevailing at this time. With this quick example, what I mean to show, the pictures reveal, these postcards reveal the anticipatory assumptions uh, that they use, linear, simplistic, deterministic, projective. But it's not only a problem of the participants of the contest uh, or that has more than uh, 100 years. In fact, generally, we are not very good indeed imagining systemic relational complex change. And imagination is fundamental to describe futures, but also to give meaning to the unknown, to sense making and making sense. Another example, let's take what happening during the COVID-19 with the supervening surprise. We, and but we, I mean humans, we got lost, disoriented, paralyzed in front of novelty. It was really very hard to make sense of what happening. And we made a lot of misunderstandings and took wrong decisions. It took time to have orientation inside the uncertainty 
surprise and ambiguity of the situation. But at the same time, we learn a lot, particularly that the future is easier to name, to use the word, or to think on plans. But to understand what really the future is, its nature, the, ontology, the ontological level, and how to effective use it, it's really very hard and difficult. In, in, uh, in this thing, in this problem, there are theoretical, philosophical aspects involved and uh, to work on, but also practical, pragmatical issues. For the robust, robust theoretical and methodological future literacy frame, as I already said, the future it doesn't exist, but we use it permanently through our imagination and anticipation. And when I'm talking about anticipation, it's not in the sense only of something that comes before another thing ahead. I'm referring to anticipatory systems and processes, anticipatory capacities and competence for making sense and sense making of reality around us. I'm finishing. <laughs> And uh, this kind of uh, subtle twist is absolutely effective to have incidents in the here and now for use in the future. This opens up alternatives that we have for choice. So we can see here that there is a clear direct relation, connection with decision making. And uh, now I'm finishing, but let me clarify what I mean by resilience. Anticipation is a, it's a core aspect of life, of evolution. Anticipatory systems and their line basis of learning, creativity, and resilience. Resilience has many definitions depending on the theoretical and discipli disciplinary approaches. In our frame, resilience is the capacity to cope with change, with uncertainty and complexity. And in a context of continuing change and novelty creation, that which means surprise, ambiguity, we need permanently to apply to resilience capacities to flow with change. No resilient organized institutions, societies can't survive. I want to highlight that uh, resilience is not a reactive or passive capacity. It's a creative property based on anticipatory systems. And in a second round, I want to explain to you then uh, a little bit shorter, which is uh, our experience working with the parliament, for example, it's one applied case, where all this uh, robust frame uh, has a very tangible, concrete relations with um, decision making. In which way? Well, trying to make uh, better uh, inputs for, uh, for decision making, open up the space of possibilities. Thank you. You can see uh, amazing, um, I, I'm sure that each one of our chairs and each one of our speakers could, could just deliver a, a fantastic keynote speech of uh, 40 minutes. <laughs> but I'm going to take each one of your contributions uh, one by one with very um, key words, uh, words that mo probably are even becoming uh, jargon, but that we really need to dissect and understand in terms of these anticipatory capacities, in terms of the complexity, uncertainty, resilience, resilience, resilience. Everybody is around that word uh, more when we know what uh, happened when we don't have uh, systems that are resilient, they just break. Um, and now I'm, I'm, I'm glad to connect that with, uh, with Antonio because Antonio, um, on all the contributions that he have uh, made uh, while uh, engaging with UNESCO, you led the work on the futures of education. And I think this will give us a very interesting insight on how um, framing the issue as in the future deliver probably broader perspectives of today and what we need to do today. Uh, you talk about the social contract, you talk about transforming education, we just have the summit, you talk about uh, being fair and more inclusive. So over to you. And, and because he's a, a professor, he's gonna use the, the podium. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel. It's a pleasure to come back here to UNESCO to talk about this report the, about the futures of education. Uh, as everyone knows, UNESCO is the most important tradition, future thinking is in education, namely with the seminar reports on the future of education, the four reports, 72, and the DLAW report, 96. Recently, a new report was produced, this time on the futures of education in the plural. The report, this report entitled, Reimagining Our Futures Together, a new social contract for education was developed from a worldwide consultation involving around 1 million people worldwide. What did we learn from this consultation? First, we learned that people didn't have anything very interesting to say about the future. Every time they tried to anticipate or project the future, the more they said were banalities, or at best, they devoted themselves to exercises in technological fiction without any relevance. This conclusion took us away from anticipation exercises, future designs, future scenarios, and even foresight perspectives. Second, we learned that people had very interesting ideas to share whenever they talked about what they were doing or trying, namely in response to the pandemic crisis. This led our commission to pay more attention to what people were doing, to their efforts to build new educational practices and processes. This is why the report is based more on listening, on narrative capacities, and on a movement to value the work done worldwide in the opening of new educational perspectives. Having started as an exercise in foresight, the report ended up, above all, as an invitation, as an invitation for educators to share their experiences and initiatives. According to our International Commission, the paths to the future are to be found in this movement of knowing and sharing. And therefore, the report proposes less to announce a future that doesn't yet exist and assumes itself above all as a means to enunciate a future that already exists. The International Commission, in this way, seeks to reinforce the most promising existing practices instead of speculating about possible futures or trying to imagine the future. Of course, obviously, in the identification of these practices, there are choices. Choices that seek to avoid the errors and faults of the past and of the present. Therefore, the principle of reparative futures inspires the entire report grounded on a human rights-based approach, a defense of education as a public and common good, and an appeal to participation and global citizenship. Two concepts, two different concepts, exemplify the starting assumptions of the report. Habitability and hospitality. That is, peace with the planet and peace with others, the defense of our common home and of our common humanity. The report presents addressing current disruptions, climate, digital, democratic, labor, mobility, demography, but assumes hope as a central element to liberate the future. This expression, liberate the future, refers to a well-known work by Ivan Illich, published in English under the title Celebration of Awareness, and in French under the title Libere l'avenir, Liberate the Futures. It's not, it's not about being 
optimistic. Only a lunatic can be optimistic in the world we live in. But it's about respecting hope. And respect for hope is a car component of any future singing or future literacy. Indeed, without hope, daily life would become insupportable and even unacceptable. It is worse for this reason to resort once again to the Latin concept of docta spes, docta spes, that is learned hope. Because hope needs to be learned and experienced in the future. The future we all know serves to give meaning to the present, or in other words, to give meaning to our efforts to transform the present. This is why the report insists so much on the need to create places and institutions for dialogue, for thinking, for sharing with the future vision. What unites us in this future literacy initiative is the conviction that only human beings know that the future exists. And also the conviction that only human beings are capable of expressing hope. More than predicting or anticipating or even less planning the future, what is really important is to create the conditions, the places, the institutions to tell our stories to each other, to work collectively on these stories, to decide which ones we want to abandon and which ones we want to continue. This is, dear friends, the line adopted by the International Commission on the Futures of Education. This is, in a sense, the intellectual dimension of UNESCO, well represented by these UNESCO shares and by this international conference. The report is based on the new more than human humanism, a more than human humanism, an appeal to a humanism of inclusion and diversity of participation and of democratic citizenship. This is the future, the futures that are worth thinking about and building together for the common good, for a common humanity, as stated yesterday in the plenary session by Achille Mbembe. It is for this future that we must prepare, that we must prepare ourselves even if we do not know how the future will be shaped. That's what an education for the future is for, to prepare, to prepare human beings for the unknown. Thank you. Well, you, you can see the passion and, the, and you can also see the publication. So uh, if you want to just go and get a copy of it. Um, and, and this is uh, very interesting because um, what, you're, what you're telling us, Antonio, is this dynamic to broaden the perspective and how at the same time you anchor it in this humanistic view, uh, which is interesting because we go around, you have your own ways and you no, know, Lydia mentioned some other ways, and but at the end this is to, to broaden the perspectives, to open the minds and to look for better solutions. And this is what we are all about. And in this sense, I want to bring you uh, over, uh, uh, Martin, with the, because because you you are the head of uh, executive uh, um, education, uh, but you follow also something that we are pursuing through these exercises, which is multidisciplinarity, breaking the silo. Take us to that front in, in knowledge creation, but also in knowledge transfer, uh, because this is also core to the exercise as we are trying to advance it. So, Thank you, ADG, and uh, good morning, dear colleagues and friends. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a real 
pleasure to be here today uh, because uh, in a sense, I feel I don't belong. Um, you may have noticed, uh, you know, executive education, business school, chair in futures literacy, yes, but for the future of finance, um, it, some eyebrows could be raised and I would perfectly understand it. Um, clearly, the financial sector is not known for its inclusivity. Um, it's not known to be really the most active uh, doing here. Um, and that was the first question I asked myself, what am I doing here? Uh, but uh, what I'd like to suggest is that if we look a little bit deeper, the financial sector, or and specifically some of the things that the financial sector does and is responsible for, is actually um, a key to reimagining the future and a key to reimagining our futures together. Now, I won't insult your collective intelligence by saying that that's because they fund and they can fund education, research, multidisciplinary approaches, and so on and so forth. First of all, that's a first order, uh, how do you say, impact. Uh, secondly, it's actually quite limited and probably raises as many issues as it solves. My point, though, is that today the financial sector is the guardian of the temple of what we consider to be valuable. The financial sector is the guardian of the temple of value. Um, whether it's through finance or economics, the frameworks that, the theoretical frameworks, the models, uh, the, um, how do you say, the mechanisms that actually run the financial world are what define value, what has value for us today, and crucially, what has value for us tomorrow. So our present actually is overwhelmingly, as we've seen through the narratives that you were talking about, Antonio and, and, and Lydia, through the work that you've done, the, uh, um, the present is overwhelmingly really influenced by our images of the future. Our ability to imagine the future or futures together is completely related to how we understand or what we believe to have value today, because that is what we naturally project into the future. If you take that reasoning a step further, what that means is that all the global challenges we're facing today, climate change, biodiversity, growing political, social unrest, choose your poison, they are all intimately related to our value system. By value system, of course, that implies ethics, but actually what we tend to forget that when we talk about value, we're also talking very much about accounting. How do you account for value? How do you measure value? And therefore, because this our business is knowledge, how do you account for knowledge? How do you value knowledge? So this brings us to the question of how does futurist literacy contribute to reimagining novel futures together. Not just futures that are extrapolations of the past. That's what I'd like to insist on. Antonio mentioned it. Usually when you ask people about the future, you either get a blank stare or something that is extremely banal. So how do you break that? How do you go beyond this poverty of imagination that clearly no, many of us suffer from. Um, and so, once again, I go back to the question of knowledge and the question of education. And if I may be a little bit provocative here, and excuse me, but we're colleagues, uh, as educators, I think we have to recognize the fact that we are part of the problem. I hope we'll also become part of the solution, but it is not a given. And I believe that unless we actually start addressing the question of the value of knowledge, what is it? How do we account for it? Who disseminates it? Does it support the existing power structures? Or on the contrary, is it an engine for change? Or really, is it just there to contribute to the status quo? 
I think these are the questions that we definitely as a business school have to address, and as a UNESCO chair also. And it is our conviction that it isn't enough to just bring together interdisciplinary teams. We do that all the time. That's very much the nature of our business. We work with corporates, we work with other universities, we work uh, with various laboratories and technology is very much the key of what we do. But that's not enough. Business as usual is not going to help us today. This, it will not tip the scales. What we really have to be able to do is to step out of our anticipatory systems, to think outside of the proverbial box, you mentioned it. But that's a lot easier said than done. Um, futures literacy, I believe, and I think we have a lot of evidence to prove to show to this, actually is a way of doing this. Let me tell you quickly how, and in a nutshell, how that could happen. Our ability to anticipate is, complete, is, is extremely constrained by cognitive biases on the one hand, and social and cultural precepts habits that we have. Um, these are learned biases, so to speak. Now, what I'd like to say, or to illustrate, is these are the images, the collective images we have of the future, these narratives that you were talking about, but that are actually quite common, um, and that are, to a large extent, something that we inherit from our environment, and we rarely question. I won't get into the details. But this means that with all the creativity that we can bring to the table, all the post-its that we can go put on those whiteboards, you've all done, done those exercises, right? Well, despite all those post-its, we are powerfully conditioned to project into the future what we know. In other words, yesterday's experience is, is going to become tomorrow's default behavior. And that's a little bit scary. Futures literacy, on the other hand, is a capability that we can develop to reveal these hidden assumptions, to question these images that we have, to understand and identify what these cultural biases are, what these cognitive biases are that limit our way of imagining or reimagining the future, or as we've mentioned a few times, the futures. I mentioned poverty of imagination a little bit earlier. This is uh, futures literacy's, one of futures literacy's founding father's favorite expressions. Uh, so quick homage to real Miller, who many of you know. But maybe another metaphor, just to illustrate what we're talking about. Today, our ability to anticipate and therefore to imagine different futures can be compared to seeing the world through one eye. Our current, anticipatory systems way of thinking. Well, what we're trying to do and what features literacy brings to the table is the capability to see the future through two eyes. And, all, as, all you, and as you all know, that gives us depth and perspective. That's what we're trying to achieve. And we won't be able to do it alone. So I very much look forward to actually being able to work with all of you to see how we can not just imagine a new future, but actually act in the present to make it happen. Thank you. Well, this is, uh, I, I have to say that, that, that he belongs here, don't you think? I, I really think that uh, even if uh, the financial sector is not a, a responsibility of UNESCO, uh, thanks God. <laughs> but but the reality is that is that all what you have mentioned in terms of uh, interdisciplinarity, the narratives. I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I agree with the poverty of ima imagination because that puts us on us, and the narratives is not an individual creation; it's a societal creation, sometimes linked to vested interest. And therefore, it's not that you're gonna change it. I'm, I'm happy to change, I'm happy to see things differently, but the reality is that we see it, the narratives are just imposing itself, the ways of seeing life imposing itself. And, and I agree that we just need to escape. And I feel that it's a very nice time to bring Alexander here because uh, with all these that we have heard from, I mean, you are in the environmental program and, uh, and the fact is that uh, with all what we have heard, it must be very easy to break with the trajectory of crashing with, the, with nature. 
we are on that trajectory and therefore we just can move it. Can we, Alexander, can you just share with us how you use this uh, very impressive toolkit uh, in, in the environmental program and, and also the, the futures labs that you're conducting? Thank you, thank you so much. Um, a word of gratitude for the, the the kind invitation from UNESCO to to share with you some ideas on on, on our common future. Um, secondly, uh, congratulations for the 30th anniversary of the Chess Program at UNESCO, and and also to congratulate uh, the the future literacy team at UNESCO. The extraordinary work that does for anticipating, for uh, providing literacy and a culture of futures for, for humanity. Um, indeed, uh, humanity might be facing one of the most critical times with the climate crisis, the triple climate crisis. The environmental climate change together with biodiversity loss and also with pollution and, and ecosystems. Uh, restoration degradation. So all together, they provide uh, a tremendous challenge for humanity. But I would like uh, to bring three key ideas on how we could uh, uh, prepare, respond, and recover for uh, possible features. The first one is uh, an understanding that we need to move from future thinking to futures action. Uh, we have to prepare ourselves for possible alternative and desired features much better. The, the criticality of our times is getting worse. It's likely that we will face a much more complex future. It's likely we will face a much more unstable future and a much more uncertain future. And the combination of all these puts us in a position to take action and to prepare our uh, decision-making circles, our action circles, to prevent as much as possible to anticipate and, and uh, for action on all these different areas. That's the, key, the first key idea, is that we have definitely to transform knowledge much faster in order that prepares ourselves to move from future thinking to future action. The second key element is the way we do it. And UNESCO is a fantastic, extraordinary example of shared values and international cooperation. We've just listened to Professor Antonio Novo and, and the importance of bringing humanity into the future of education uh, and, and the, understand how people are doing it. Well, in the UN system as well, we have to change radically to a nexus approach. There's no way we can separate the climate crisis from the humanitarian crisis, from the peace and security realms, from the international rule of law and the human rights. The five pillars of the UN have to act together. There's a need for a nexus approach. If a tropical hurricane impacts Madagascar, revamps center Mozambique, moves flooding and, and the next year having droughts in the same place of the floods and then moves to Malawi and then devastates Zimbabwe. And if this happens impacting on education systems, on poverty, impacting on humanitarian lives, we cannot approach this problem as an environmental problem. We have to approach it as a nexus as a nexus across the fundamental five pillars that the UN is built upon. And that nexus approach will provide us much better grounds for tackling future. The third key idea is that we are today in a much better position than in the past about using data and knowledge for prevention, for response, and for recovery. And, and, and that data knowledge that we can use using early warning systems, using the combination of a foresight analysis and scenarios building, and putting everything into systems models that we can prepare ourselves to act much better and to have much better impact on saving lives of people, on protecting places and protecting our planet. Uh, we have to start using this Nexus approach combined with uh, what is defined in the common agenda as data, technology and innovation, foresight, 
together. Uh, and, and these will help us to be in a, in, in a much better position to tackle not only the climate crisis, but the humanitarian crisis and the human humanity crisis that we are facing. This is all discussed in a number of areas where uh, the Future Lab of the UN is, is a fantastic initiative for preparing us for, for the future, as it is the most intergenerational features discussion that is being held across the UN system as well. So all these together will prepare us for a better future. So I would say we have to move from thinking to action. We have to act together in a nexus approach and we have to tackle using the fundamental tools we have available today to turn uh, to turn our efforts into successful efforts for our intergeneration features. And I'll stop here, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very, very interesting insights for one of the of the greatest challenges. But there is something I really want to keep because you will be hearing more uh, from us. I, I, I love the futures literacy. This is something I, I, I mean, it's unique for UNESCO and this we are contributing and we have uh, 35 chairs. Uh, do we have more chairs on futures in the, in, the, in the audience? Can you raise your hands? Look at them. Great to see you. Yeah, so there you are. Uh, so that's great. But something that Alexander said, uh, building the different scenarios, having data to understand what are the trajectories in those different scenarios, looking at what are the underlying dynamics that bring us to different pathways. And we all know that the, the only thing that we are sure is that we need to change the pathways. That's the only thing we know. Uh, but talking to Christine, we, we are in that in that track, using data, understanding what are the different uh, scenarios that we can build and how we can change it, which is something that you also do with the future educations. And I want to bring then Julius, because you, you've seen education, environment, uh, finance. Uh, what about technology? What about innovation? I mean, this is one of the most dynamic uh, areas. Here at UNESCO, we're very glad also to be the house of the ethics of science and technology. We just achieved this uh, ethics of artificial intelligence against to bring the technological development towards delivering for people. Um, and so what, what about this conversation in the context of a highly innovative world, sometimes not for the best? So, Julius. Ah, okay, thank you. Thank you, Director Ramos. Yes, uh, just first of all, to give you a bit of a background where, where we are coming from. Uh, I'm, from, I'm with a university called the Rankimati University of Technology. Uh, this is the university based in the central part of Kenya. And uh, it's a university actually built from, it's a product of anticipation. If you think of it of, of history, the local community set up a vocational school because they wanted their children to learn some technologies to help them farming. And these children later got educated and went to university or diaspora, came up together and said, can we upgrade this uh, vocational institute to a university? And they did it through a community action. And finally, now it's a public university. But the idea is that even people at, without much education do have anticipation and they do understand. And they thought that technology could actually solve their problem. They understood they were farmers, they needed te technology. And therefore, one of the things, and in fact, the name for the chair is a socio technical anticipatory system, because the whole idea is better understand how a technology university can respond to social problems. So, really, one of our challenges is really to see how, as a technology, we can deal with issues of, of development. Uh, building a sustainable community, resilient community that has been mentioned. So really, one way is how to help engineers think in a different way. And this is quite important because if you think of it, engineer, our, our education system tend to have a colonial past and we tend to think, even educate students in a different way because right out of the door there are problems, but when you are solving problems, we are solving different problems. And I can give this as an testing because when I did my engineering degree, the first engineering degree, when I went to the village and they, they were trying to build a church, I think, or something, and they wanted me to help them, and I realized I didn't know how to deal with simple structures because 
in our project, we're already doing a structure of, uh, to do some something of 30 stories and so on. Which told you that uh, the education system was not really responding to the actual needs of our society. And later on, as, you, as, as I worked as an engineer in the government, that's when I really got into this idea of working with community because some people came up and they wanted to build a simple bridge. The community had organized money and they wanted, let's have a bridge. And for once I felt this is how we need to understand how does technology, and when we think of innovation, what is innovation? Because uh, we tend to think of innovation in a certain way. And as this is what has been called the, the lack of imagination that sometimes we want to innovate, but what do we want to innovate for? And if we're, if we're a society, is it innovation, is it engineering? Because that's what we want to bring to even the students. In, because one way you can innovate, yes, you can have a good te technology solution, but you don't have a business model innovation around it. If you don't have a policy innovation around it, if you don't have social innovation around it, then you, don't have, you are not solving any problem. So the idea is really to start embedding this kind of thinking into the education, into the engineering education. So that students have a new capability, a new skill, a new way of thinking about a problem, reimagining problems of the society, and then coming up with also quite what you'd call innovative, imaginative solution. Frugal, frugal innovations obviously are needed in, in, in different contexts, but frugal innovation doesn't mean simply, it just really means sometimes you can think of it in a way, an extreme engineering, because you're really trying to solve problems in a different way. So for example, if you may think of uh, the current, some of the, uh, the, the crises that have been mentioned, uh, for example, the, the shift to green economy, uh, new kinds of energy. Yes, we have had solar technology all, all there. And uh, for example, in Africa, there's sun throughout. But then the fact that you have this technology, that means that people will take, uptake it. If you don't think, how do we work with this technology? How do we make it available? And one, one, one interesting example that I've seen is a company called M Copa. What they have done, say, yes, you're not going to tell poor people to buy solar panel, to buy the relevant equipment and lighting system, but if we could install them for them and have a, a mobile app where you can do micro payments, then they just need to pay for the service. So you can see this is that they have taken different innovations together and being able to provide a solution. And this one thing that we want to help our students to think in a different way, to think of it this, this way. So much as you are a technology, how do you start understanding how are your social problems? How can they be solved? What kind of business innovation do you need? What kind of social innovation do you need? What kind of policy innovation do you need to go with this innovation? So to give you that broader thinking. And in that way, we also need to work with different communities. So beyond uh, the, the students where we are trying to, to put together an elective and also just a common cause that can provide these features literacy capability, uh, it's not enough that you don't, you have to work with the community. You have to work with the policymakers, parliament. Uh, right now we're also working with the, the, the key government uh, think tank. We have to start thinking of how do we reimagine industrialization? Because as you know, things are changing quite rapidly. Uh, we have fourth industrial revolution. We have moved to green economy. Therefore, all the parts that we have talked about before, uh, China's uh, Asian tigers and such, all those are off the table. So you have to think of different way of reimagining your, your way to industrialize. And, and I'll talk about this later because we did some work for Sadiq on that. But the idea is that you need to educate policymakers. But more importantly, is a community. Because as I said, we are a product of community. So how do we engage the community themselves? But if you think of features, in this language, you may have all these brochures, practitioners, guides and such, but they're in English, yeah? But, uh, how can you translate local languages? How do I go to the community and talk to them and give them that language? Because it's when you give the language of anticipation to the community, because they are the ones who engage with political class and political class make all decisions. And much as you can talk in policy making circles and such, if you can't get the politicians to make decisions, you're not going to have actions. And what one thing that we have been looking at as part of our program is try to understand how did people traditionally engage with the features, how do they engage in anticipation? And if you go to the proverbs, and if you go to the mythologies, and if you go to the storytellings, actually these were engaged. And this is how even people did policy making in that way, elders or whoever sat. They use, you find that they, the language they tended to use was proverbs, had a lot of images, uh, storytelling, and all this captured the uh, uh, stories of the future. 
And this, if we can bring that back to political discourse, then we can have a chance of having political, also have future seek. Because all across, you might find all kind, kind of countries have visions and so on. They tend not to be stable because political regimes come and things change. But it's when you have that language, how can you empower the community so that every time they go to the community and they talk, they are seeing a different language. So to me, language is also very, very important just to, to help people have that, that uh, language of anticipation that then gets embedded into decision making. So that's something that we are trying to see. How can we bring that uh, discourse? How can we show people that these futures or anticipatory thinking that we are trying to bring, it's not a new discipline. It has been there, we're just bringing it a different way. So it, it is not something new. Again, this idea of decolonization. Another key important thing, when we think of futures, as I said, in an innovation, because obviously innovation is going to be key. But as has been mentioned, imagination first is what matters a lot because you have to be able to imagine different futures, then you can do the innovations needed to try and drive towards those better futures. And if you think of uh, imagination, how do you bring that back? And how do you help people to see the future in a different way? Because the seeds of the future are already there. If you look at it now, things are happening. Uh, there are certain key uncertainties evolving and you can see pockets there because the pockets are always, always there. The future is imagined and it's how we understand it and how we identify these pockets. Then you can make decisions on what to support and what to make driving. And this way it comes to like, I think there is a three horizons framework that uh, has been uh, used. Because on one hand you have going to a new horizon, then you have the, that, the one that is going down, the past future that is get, getting eroded, but in between getting to the what we want in the future, they are what you call some, if you think of H1 as a business as usual, and H3 as where we are trying to go, the H2 is which is helping us navigate to the future. And there are always two tensions because embedded interests that are there are always trying to see how do we, because there is a legacy investment on everything, and we try to have innovations that can make the current system work. And that is supported a lot. For example, uh, we don't want to move away from coal so we can create coal capture, carbon capture technologies to make that uh, technology move ahead rather than move to new technologies. Because already, uh, I think uh, it was emphasized here, finance uh, uh, invested structures are already there. And there's, so there's a huge incentive to try and keep the status quo through innovation to support it, kind of give it a scaffolding. But if it's when you start going to whole different way of thinking that requires, uh, that can drive us to those features. But then that's where you also encounter problems because they're innovators who are thinking differently, they are social innovators, they are political, and, and sometimes they don't think together and there was always tension. So the question is, for us is how to try to managing these tensions. So when we think of innovation, we want to think of innovation in that broader sense. How do we bring all these kind of innovators together and how do we make technology and other social innovators, political innovators, yeah. All of them work together in a, to, to start driving us towards those desirable features. So that's the kind of thinking that uh, we are trying to, to drive. So I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Well, I, as, as I said, it's just, it's just amazing because each one of you, I mean, we could have just have each one of you and dissect everyone, uh, every single item that you are uh, uh, putting at the table. Uh, you have seen the power of our chairs. We have uh, Europe, we have Africa, we have Latin America. Uh, this was fantastic, and of course, our our dear partners and in, in crime in so many in so many aspects. But the whole point is how do we get out of the current frameworks? This is what I'm hearing all the time. You are redefining innovation. This is super important because we have a way of thinking about it. And, and now I feel it's very good that we have uh, Chris with us because, because he is uh, leading with the, with the, with the with UNESCO, is, it's a, a UNDP and um, a Global Pulse, uh, the um, Futures Lab. And I think this is something super excited that I want you to tell the, our audience um, because then we will not have time as each one of my speakers have taken ample time to explain their issues, uh, I would not go for a second round, but what I will do is after listening to Chris and how the UN system is trying to embrace this with the very strong leadership of Secretary General Guterres, uh, then I would like to engage you uh, and take some of your uh, comments and, and we will then uh, go back to, to the speakers. Uh, so Chris, uh, please over to you. 
Hi, everyone. Morning. Can you hear me okay? Good. Um, I'm quite aware that we've got 25 minutes and then there's a coffee break. So I'm going to try and keep this fairly brief. Um, first of all, thanks very much for, for having me and, and putting together this uh, amazing panel. Um, I feel quite honoured to be a part of all of you including you, Alexander, online. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about um, the UN Futures Lab. Um, and I wanted to pick up really where the conversation started um, at the beginning, which is the Secretary General's report called Our Common Agenda. Um, if you haven't read it, read it. It's one of the most inspirational things, I think, that the, that the UN leadership has come out with in, in recent decades. Um, and I really think that this uh, report, uh, which um, in which uh, the Secretary General outlines a number of proposals to member states and to societies, um, is something that he put out there that we can all coalesce around. Um, and really the starting point, I think, for the Secretary General and his teams uh, across the United Nations, including with UNESCO, UNDP and, and many other bits of our wonderful organisation, um, is that it's just not good enough. Where we're at at the moment is just not good enough. We're at a junction where we really do see a binary set of options. One is a world in which we see perpetual breakdown in which we see perpetual crises, in which we see pandemics, in which we see degraded or a loss of trust, where we see a lack of diversity in decision-making. Another world is perhaps a more bright world, a world in which we see economies flourish, in which we see um, business as usual being challenged quite forthrightly by all manner of societies, from business through to civil societies, through to the institutions that many of us work for. And so for me, um, our common agenda was really the starting point for our United Nations to think very differently about how we collectively imagine futures and how we collectively drive actions to bring about more preferred futures for our world and for the people that we serve. So uh, back in uh, about a year and a, a bit ago, um, the idea came about to form something called the UN Futures Lab. Um, and this institution or this bit of our organization would be something that could help catalyze many of the foresight activities, many of the futures thinking activities across our United Nations systems and to coalesce around collective action for more preferred futures or better futures. Now, within our common agenda, the Secretary General outlines uh, four main proposals. And, and one, of the, one of the proposals is very, very much uh, forward thinking. He thinks about having uh, the UN Futures Lab fine. Uh, there's the Summit of the Future, which is going to be an exciting um, opportunity for all, all of us to coalesce around key actions and activities in 2024. But really what, what, um, what I'm in charge of at the moment is trying to get off the ground the UN Futures Lab. And if any of you have ever worked in, in UN organizations and tried to start up new initiatives, uh, you'll understand that this is no small undertaking. I have more gray hair in my beard and in my, and in my uh, thinning hair uh, than I did one year ago. And that's because we've got a great opportunity here to build something new for our UN system and for our world. So what we're looking at doing is quite simple, really. Uh, we're, we're looking at uh, putting together a bit of the organization that's uh, multidisciplinary, that's a multi-agency um, effort. Um, so right at the beginning, we've been uh, able to secure the interest and the commitments from UNESCO, thank you very much, uh, from a bit of the organization called UN Global Pulse, which is the Secretary General's innovation um, initiative uh, that started about 12 years ago. Uh, we're very lucky to be joined by UNDP, the development program. And we're also being uh, joined by something called the Development Coordination Office, which, which pulls together many of the development efforts and initiatives from across the, the UN system. What I wanted to tell you today um, is that you have an opportunity to participate in this Futures Lab. You have an opportunity to participate in the thinking that underpins the lab, and you also have an opportunity to participate in the actions and the activities and the exercises that the Futures Lab will be putting together in the coming months. The lab's going to be networked. Um, we can't do it alone. We don't want to do it alone. The diversity of thought that exists outside of our UN system is incredible. And it's the power of this diversity that we need to be able to tap in through, through a networked approach. The networks, not only the experiences, the understandings, and the, um, and the universal truths that exist within the United Nations system, making best use of all of those in an, aggravate, in an aggregated, not aggravated uh, view of what, what investments have already been put into futures thinking, into foresight activities, but really reaching outside of the UN system as well. 
The second thing we're going to do is we're going to really make um, we're going to make foresight accessible. And I know that sounds a little bit. Uh, and maybe it is a little bit, uh, but a lot of the times when I walk into foresight activities or I, I, I listen to experts and technical experts talk about futures, there's a lot of nomenclature that I just don't understand. And that's me as a, you know, I'm, I'm you know, not proudly British, uh, but I am British and my, my first language is English. And primarily the languages that, that we are using to, to discuss futures and foresight, at least in the international community, tends to be English. And so if I'm using nomenclature, if I'm using words, if I'm using um, exercises and activities that aren't understood in common parlance, which don't have clear outcomes, which don't have clear outputs which don't feed into clear decision making fora for example then i'm not making foresight accessible and i'm missing that inclusivity and i'm not able to dig into that diversity that exists that we need to create better futures for our world so we're going to we're going to really focus on making foresight accessible capacity support training fellowships making sure that our leadership making sure that our managers making sure that our leaders understand the spaces that they too can create for foresight in really really simple ways and then the last thing that we're going to do is we're going to distill all of the diversity of thoughts we're going to distill all of the reports and papers and all of the exercises and data that we're producing on foresight in the un and beyond on a daily basis weekly basis monthly basis we're going to repackage it we're going to use creative ways to turn those insights and those signals from those horizon scans, from that back casting activity and exercises, and we're going to transfer it and transform it into actionable, inspirational fora and media that can inspire change within the UN system and outside. And the good news is the work's already started. We've got the highest levels of support. The Secretary General himself engaged in the first foresight activity that, um, that was launched under Global Pulse, which the Futures Lab is, is very closely related to. It was in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. He wanted to understand with his senior management group, his um, cabinet, I suppose, at the top of the UN system, what could the future look like? And how do we need to adapt our own institution, our own organization uh, to, to produce more actions, to produce better actions for more preferred futures? That was the starting point. And we've continued with a range of, with a range of experiments. It's the most exciting bit of the UN I've ever worked in. And I, join, I, I invite you to join us in our efforts moving forwards. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, yes, we are we are really excited about this uh, uh, fantastic opportunity that is open uh, by the interest of our leadership in advancing uh, this tool for better decision making. Uh, I really want to underscore what Chris said in terms of inclusivity. This votes very well with what uh, Julius and also Lydia was saying in terms of how do we don't go with the answers, don't go with the tools, don't go, but just engage in a meaningful conversation, uh, learning from others that might not have this framing, but that they know exactly what we're talking about, because it's about change, it's about improving well-being, it's about doing things better. And, and UNESCO is really pleased to be, uh, along with the UNDP, Global Pulse, and Chris, uh, the institution that is uh, putting the framing on, on, the, on the methodologies, starting a process, a process. This is something that Christine tell me, this is a process, it's, a, it's not a one-off, it's a process that we need to engage for change. Uh, so you have heard our wonderful, wonderful uh, panelists. I, uh, with the with the Robbie's permission, I, I'm gonna open the the floor um, for your comments. Very brief, please, so we are able to take uh, the more we can, and then uh, introduce yourself, and then uh, we'll go uh, for this very good round. Please. Yeah. Uh, good morning. My name is Massimiliano Tarot, UNESCO Chair in Global Citizenship Education at University of Bologna, Italy. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. I, I really enjoy listening to you. Um, I would like to raise a, um, an issue about the, um, the possibility for reimagining the future for all. Uh, in the early 70s, an, a cultural anthropologist in Italy made an interesting study about underprivileged students, adolescents in the 
um, underserved area in the south of Italy, and she discovered that those young people were unable, to, were simply unable to, to pronunciate the future, to conjugate the verbs at the future tense, because they were simply unable to, re, to imagine their future. So my question is, um, since I totally agree with you, especially with Nova, when we say that the, 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 the hope is a central, it's a central idea for liberating the future. So my question is, how can we empower all, all people to imagine the future, especially those who are marginalized, those who are oppressed? How can we uh, empower them? How can education uh, remove barrier for enjoying the right of the future for all and everyone? I think that's the size of the of the challenge because it's not about us, <laughs> it's about everybody. Uh, keep that question and maybe Antonio, Lydia, you were uh, dealing with these issues. Any, anybody else wants to raise their hand back there, please? Yes. Do we have the mic? Oui. Uh, bonjour. I'm going to speak French. The interpreters want you to know that the sound is absolutely terrible down in the interpreting booths. But we will do our best. There is no interpretation from Spanish into French, so I'm going to have to speak Spanish. I apologize for my French. I come from Colombia. where I had a UNESCO chair for improving quality and equality in education in Latin America, based on reading and writing, on literacy. We are a network of 154 universities, so we are an international network ourselves bringing together a lot of universities in Latin America. You have pointed out that training is very important, and it is true. But when, when you work in a university, you always ask yourself, is, is training really enough? And it isn't. Both students, all students, have to develop their critical mind. And in order to have a critical mind, the students are going to have to learn how to read critically. They are going to have to learn to understand the different types of discourses and anticipate where these discourses are aiming, understanding the different points of view, the different types of, of perspectives. And if they are to understand that, we're going to change the paradigm of, of teaching, even when we're teaching in people's mother tongues. I'm not only referring to linguistic structures in in language itself, but I'm talking about the structure of, of discourse. The different types of discourse represent different types of power relations. If you are to actually be empowered in this way, you have to word more in a dialogical manner. In, you have to understand different things such as humanity, respect, anticipating diff that other people see the world in different ways than you do. Thank you. I have one last uh, comment. Please be brief. I feel that we are getting into, well, uh, uh, no, I, can, I cannot have you all, guys, on, unless you promise that it will be really a very fast, uh, please. One, two, three, and that's it, please. The mic for her, please. Thank you so much. Um, I am the Patricia Morales, coordinator of the UNESCO Chair 
on human security. I believe uh, following the two previous interventions that is important the education for the future, but we have a needed critical uh, philosophical reflection needed, in particular because of the human insecurity, let me say. We are in a moment of a critical situation of the human condition. We have a lot of weapons, war, and the people cannot anticipate the future. The young people cannot anticipate the future because we are in a real critical situation. We have about the financial situation, a concentration of more than, I, I suppose now, in 1% of the population has the same amount of richness that the 90-90% of population. That means what kind of democracy we have is this concentration of the money are in only 1% of our global population. We have a critical problem of climate change and of the oceans, etc. And nobody takes the main point. And the problem is if we create an illusion that the future is the future granted by inter artificial intelligence, that is also wrong because artificial intelligence put at the question the real protection of the human condition. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Now we go there, please. Um, I have a very sh short question. Uh, I, I see a danger uh, that uh, foresight, futures, and anticipation, scenarios, whatever, it might be just nice words, not something real. Uh, I, I heard from s some of you that we need data, technological innovation, and uh, scenarios, and whatever, uh, some more substantial studies r related to futures, not just blah, blah, and uh, that's it. What, what, what do you think we, 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 we could make to make it really substantial for, for people, for policy making, for, for everybody? Thank you. And the last one. Thank you very much. Um, I am uh, Professor Michael Skoulos, uh, uh, UNESCO Chair and uh, Network on Sustainable Development Management and Education from the Mediterranean. Uh, really uh, excellent in, uh, um, interventions and speeches. Um, I still have uh, uh, two questions. One is the different futures are connected or not. I mean, in my understanding, the humanity is like a, a caterpillar, a long caterpillar. It's a different future for the head and a different from the tail. And these futures are the different parts of the caterpillar. The other is a series of pockets uh, that it was not connected. It is important to understand these models or the coexistence of these models. And the second thing is from sustainable development management, the most about technologies and the rest, the most inert part is the institutions. So how in your presentations, the institutions and everything were not identified, but it is an important thing. We start from the uh, fast or from the slow part for the future. But I said, like here, and you thought it was you, which is great because you did the wonderful. But I also want you, yes, you, to to make the last uh, question, and then I go back to all of you. I I think that you have received very strong critical minds that are challenging you. So please, the last one. Thank you. I'm Nastasia Pugliesi. I'm from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and I hold the chair on history of women. And I just want to strengthen the critique that came before. Um, I don't like the idea of imagining. Um, I think that with imagination, we create fairy tales and with reason, we construct realities. So I want to I want you all to think about the idea of reasoning the future, right? I think that's the, the real challenge, like creating material conditions for development. Thank you. 
Okay, so what we heard is, is a lot of challenging and also a lot of asking really how this can work for change. So uh, I will ask you to be very brief. So we, we start from here to, to the end, uh, two minutes each. Uh, you need to convince them <laughs> that we're proposing is going to bring change, that we can engage people, that we can change the way we define things, that we can address the crisis, that is not just blah, blah. So uh, over to you, Antonio. <laughs> very, very quickly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, on, on the questions by our two colleagues from Colombia and Patricia Morales, I think we, I totally agree with your points, and I believe that uh, uh, our report on the futures of education addresses both questions that you are that you are asking. Uh, on these last on these last interventions, what I would say is that I, I totally agree. Also, it's for me. It's about collective action, it's about collective thinking, and it's about how to frame the institutions and organize what I told two or three times in my intervention, how to build the places, the institutions for collective dialogue, for collective thinking, for collective action. That's for me, it's, it's really what is important in this discussion and not the blah, blah, blah that you were talking about. Yes, there are different futures, but when seeing that it's very clear from yesterday to today in all our interventions is that we have been talking about the Kamen many times. The Kamen is the starting concept of this report. The Kamen humanity, the Kamen agenda, the Kamen home, uh, the Kamen work, and so the car construction. And so, yes, there are different futures, but there are also this idea of commonality, of commoning as it was discussed yesterday by Achille Mbembe. I, I, totally, uh, I totally agree with your point. And then I will go back to the first point, which I think it's a very, very important one. The idea that uh, there are many people that they cannot think about the future. I can tell you, maybe I not, I can. 30 seconds. One of the stories that was my impressive for me, it was in Brazil. These kids on the streets that could kill someone in five seconds. And once I asked one of the, my colleagues, how is this possible? And the answer was because these kids, they have no idea what is the future in 24 hours. For them, the life ends in this moment. And so for us to kill someone is to have a problem in the future, to go to prison or whatever. These kids, they have no idea of what is the future in five minutes. And so I totally agree with you, your point. I think it's very important. It was not raised during our discussion, and I'm very happy that you raised it. Thank you. Martin, please. Thank you so much. Impossible to answer all of your questions, and I'd love to address each one of them. Maybe the one I should focus on um, is the one about imagination, uh, uh, because it's also related to the other question about action. Uh, I think it's important to understand that imagination is not, uh, or rather the future, and therefore our ability to imagine the future, is not an exercise in futility or in projection. It is because the future does, whether we like it or not, whether we're aware of it or not, have an impact on what we consider possible in the present. It is in that respect that the future and our ability to imagine the future is absolutely fundamental because it is perception. So what, what we see as possible action is a function of what we perceive to be the future action, whether it is killing someone in the next five minutes because my future is very short, or whether it is a much longer perspective, it is actually the same mechanism. And so uh, we are very much, and futures literacy is very much not about imagining the future to have, oh, let's have fun with this, but in order to feed our, if we're talking business, our strategic plans, if we're talking policy making, the policies, because again and again, we see that we fail to achieve our objectives. That's a reality. So at what point do we wake up, smell the coffee and say, well, maybe we need to do things differently. Please, please. Hello, thank you. Yeah, I'll make a few comments. And actually just adding on to the imagination, how, how you think of your imagination, and maybe yeah, there's a bit of, can talk of heritage, but really the key is really to help people think in a different way. If I'm going to help an engineer to solve a problem, 
He has to think in a different way. He has to be able to envision that problem in a very different way. So, for example, if you are going to say you are going to save food security and so on, you can say you can have a cold chain, you can have all these kind of solutions that we know. But uh, in a situation of limited resources and such, you need to be more imaginative in the kind of solutions. So, is that kind of imagination? I think we, we are trying to we are trying to put together. And the question of marginalized that that's really important because that's one thing that we want to see. How do we, as I said, we want to involve the community around the university because those are the people who build the university. And this would probably be people who, even if you are going to do this, it has to be done in local languages. So that's something that we really have to start thinking about. How do we bring the futures to the local people? And actually, we did one program for, for youth, the marginalized youth with the voluntary services organization in Kenya. We did one on the future of work. Uh, basically from the perspective of fourth industrial revolution. And you can imagine these are youths who didn't finish school, most of them, uh, very low education. And VSO has been trying to see how to help them uh, to, to build skills and to, to be engaged. And interesting enough, they, they were quite uh, engaged. And, and, but I think that is work in progress, something that we really appreciate as our chair, that we really need to see how do we move beyond the ivory tower? How do we move outside the gate? Because if you move outside the gates of university, there are villages there immediately. And sometimes we move and go to town, we never really engage the people there. So that is a, a challenge to us. And we are thinking about it and we want to actually hold future literacy laboratory with those kind of communities. Yeah, so that is, uh, and the other thing was also to think of how do you make it critical? Uh, actually, what, what you're trying to do is, because we have a common cause at university for critical thinking, we have to watch, want to add something on features literacy together so that they, they work together so that features literacy becomes supplementary to the critical thinking. Because yes, critical thinking to me, I also believe is important. And the other thing that maybe I want uh, that was, was also mentioned is that, and this is something that I'm also maybe will grapple with. Seeds of the future are already there. We say the future you imagined. Because for example, the work we did for, for Sadiq, uh, we came up with two key uncertainties. On one hand, obviously, you have sustainability, potential for green economy, potential for green washing. The other hand, you have fourth industrial revolution where you have a democratic uh, technology or you have these big monopolies that we already see happening. And that creates all kinds of features. I gave you Mcopa one way of a feature that is trying to empower people. But obviously, we have Uber. The other day in Kenya, there was a strike of Uber drivers. Every day they are striking because they are basically sweatshops. Okay. So those... Those are the things that, that they, they are living together, but I, we have to see how to make them work differently. Oh, thank, oh, you. Yeah, thank you. No, I, I really think that the, all of you are really going into the nitty gritty and how this can lead to very different outcomes, because that's the whole point. Lydia? Okay. Well, yes, imagination, it's a, a high cognitive capacity and is the capacity that allows us to work with possibility. And uh, because, as, as I said, uh, from our work, uh, framework, the future itself, it doesn't exist, but we use it permanently as imagination and anticipation. And I agree that uh, the key task is to have extended social extended anticipatory capacities. And this is, uh, I think, the main challenge for future literacy framework, to make it uh, as a social extensive capacity. And um, we work, um, maybe you can uh, be asking, how can we work with imagination and make it concrete and not uh, only fiction. Well, we work with a concept that is uh, called anticipatory assumptions. For us, this is the fundamental um, aspect uh, that allows us to, to make uh, it tangible, concrete. And uh, to work with anticipatory assumptions is uh, directly related with uh, critical thinking, with reflexivity. So uh, that's the a, a concrete link. And uh, maybe it's also the point of leverage for change. Because when we experiment changing anticipatory assumptions, we change the way that we see 
the present. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, what we want is to open up the alternatives, the possibilities in the present. Thank you. Very well said. Chris, please. I'm going to be really quick. I think that it's just about designing good interventions. Um, and I think if your intervention is good, then you have a clear outcome in mind. And I think you have a clear link to a decision that needs to be made and you help somebody make a better decision. So for me, I think you have good foresight. I think you have bad foresight. I think you have everything in between. So if we're going for good foresight, which I think we are, then we need to design our interventions as, as best we can. And that's linked to action and it's linked, therefore, to better futures. Alex, over to you. You have your two minutes. That will be very brief. Um, I, I do think when planning uh, the Museum of the Future, uh, uh, there were three core elements that were taken into account. One was design, uh, imagination. The second one was design. And the final one was execution. And the one was not possible without the others. So uh, th these work together. Uh, I think the key relies on putting foresight into action. On, uh, and, and selecting first, selecting the right level, because if it's not at the right level, it cannot impact on people. I'll give a clear example. We are uh, doing a, a, an analysis, a system analysis of Somalia and the interdependencies between environment and conflict. It's clear for us that the complexity involving in just connecting two topics will allow us to come with scenarios and leverage points how to tweak environmental variables to have impact on conflict and how to work with those in the future. Uh, we need to select the right level of action, and that right level should impact on people and places and turn not the blah, blah, blah into concrete scenarios and options for possible desired and alternative features. The second thing was referred there. Uh, in fact, humanity faces insecurity. So there's no way we can disentangle the pillars and fundamentally the pillars of the UN and the fundamental pieces. We have to work in a nexus approach. Th this will be my, my, my uh, key take uh, in terms of how to put things and foresight into action. Thank you. And, and I have to say that uh, this was just a glimpse of how much this way of doing things can have impact. And that's what we're aiming for. And I think this is what we want to leave with you. It's not that you are going to become a uh, uh, foresight or future tellers or uh, you will have the capacities but what we want to say is that these are methodologies that work and actually we are bound to make them work better and for that I just want to give two more minutes to Christine Pfeiffer to close the session because she's the one that is going to tell us uh, what UNESCO is going to be doing uh, and then you will accompany me to uh, clap this fantastic fantastic panel so Christine Thank you very much. Um, we heard your call loud and clear to, to make sure we are not uh, there and, and, and talk about blah, blah, blah. <laughs> what I want to address here is that together with the team at the SHS, and I guess I can speak also for our colleagues in the education sector, we will be continuing to have this kind of brainstorming because yes, futures is a, let's say it's not a destination, but it is a process itself. It starts with a blah, 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 and maybe uh, a collecting critical mass, which, which we consider is fundamental at UNESCO, and yeah, take it forward uh, and bring it into action. I, I have some, I took some notes on, on what we all share in common, so what I understand, it is to better become able to avoid fragility, uh, embrace complexity, respect uncertainty, develop resiliency, and to take advantage of creativity. And in our view, this all leads uh, to create better conditions for peace, which is one of the core mandates of UNESCO. And what we also, I think, have seen is that we need more time. <laughs> we need to uh, dive deeper uh, um, into this conversation. And that's why UNESCO convened on the 2nd of December upcoming, so more or less one month, the World Futures Day here at our headquarters again, where there will be the opportunity to, to continue uh, this discussion. And you are all uh, welcome to, to make sure we reflect uh, the interdisciplinary approach that we are uh, focusing on for better futures. So thank you very much. And I have to say we are super, super well equipped 
I think that you are the highest professional on these issues. You're dealing with so many other areas, but you are deploying these methodologies to get better answers. And I really want to thank you for being with us. Thank you for opening the space. Thank you for opening the, the thinking. Thank you for challenging the assumptions. And thank you for letting us know that there are different ways to build better futures because that's what it is all about. So thank you for, for joining us only five minutes late. I think it's fine, <laughs> but uh, thank you. And, and big applause to our panelists and to Christine, please. Okay, thank you for your patience. So the, the panel is, is completely unbalanced. Uh, and so we get our last speaker, but we, we will start nevertheless. Um, we've got in, we, we've got the afternoon in, in in I would say two segments, um, and the first one takes us until 3:30. Uh, um, part of the concluding session, uh, part of looking forward and in line with one of UNESCO's main functions as a laboratory of ideas. The session is intended to begin to chart uh, a way forward to explore the potential of the UNESCO chair Unitwin uh, networks uh, to serve as a global think tank or as a, a, a global uh, observatory. Just allow me here to recall, we have mentioned it perhaps at different uh, points in, since the beginning of yesterday, but that um, the spirit uh, behind this and behind the, 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 the UNESCO Chairs Unit Twin program is really enshrined in UNESCO's uh, constitution and its uh, uh, and one of the articles in its uh, in its uh, founding act and prom promoting just and sustainable futures for all through the intellectual moral solidarity of humankind in all the fields of our mandates, initially education, uh, culture, and science, uh, but we know that that has gone on. Behind this is the idea or the principles of the right to information, the right to knowledge, the right to education, the right to culture, the right to science, um, as part of our shared heritage and, and part of the global commons. Um, so we've got with us, um, on, on the first part of this panel, uh, a number of uh, UNESCO chairs and national commissions uh, who will share with us a little bit their experiences and insights, not about what they're doing, but how they see the potential. In some cases, it is dynamics uh, that have emerged um, and some thoughts and insights on how we can strengthen really the cooperation within the program, not in terms of mechanics, but in terms of moving uh, towards um, uh, more impactful knowledge generation, translating um, into action. In the second part, we will shortly hear from, at 3.30, we will hear from the senior leadership of UNESCO, each leading in their various sectors, uh, give uh, their insights. So we have uh, with us Professor Leon uh, Tickley, uh, chairholder, uh, chair, UNESCO Chair on Inclusive and Quality Education for All at the University of Bristol. Um, Rajesh Sandon, uh, who is a co-chairholder of the UNESCO Chair in um, Community-Based Research and Social Responsibility in Higher Education. We have uh, with us at, in the uh, middle Alexander um, Alexander Navarro, who is the Secretary General of the French National Commission for UNESCO, our partner as well here, might be speaking both um, um, uh, in the name of the experience of the French National Commission, but also possibly out of a discussion um, uh, among national commissions earlier this morning. We then have uh, the honor of having with us at, uh, on your right end uh, the Italian team, I would say, uh, and first uh, former Minister of Education, Professor Patricio uh, Bianchi, uh, who is with us, 
um, and Enrico Vigenti, the Secretary General of, of the National Commission, also to share an interesting experience at national level of moving towards uh, an inter, um, interdisciplinary uh, uh, think tank. Let's start with um, Leon Tickley. Uh, Leon, uh, you have looked at, you've done a bit of analysis of, of some of the chair activities and looked at it through the lens of transdisciplinarity, which is where the direction we want to move. So, uh, very pleased if you could share some of those thoughts, what you have seen through that analysis. From here or here? As you wish. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Oh, <laughs> it's always a bit of a shock when you hear yourself echoing around the room. Anyway, good afternoon, everybody, and, and thank you very much, uh, Sobi, for the kind introduction and for the invite. Um, this is a very important uh, topic, and I'm delighted to be joined to be in such prestigious company to, to talk about this. Um, and, of course, we've heard a lot about the, the virtues, the importance of transdiscipline, transdisciplinary working uh, based on principles of knowledge co-creation and equitable partnership working during the course of this, this wonderful conference. Uh, we've, heard, we've heard about how transdis transdisciplinary approaches, uh, which, which are not just based on, on bringing together different academic disciplines, but also on bringing together different knowledge systems from inside and outside of the academy, uh, to, to in, in the spirit of transformative change uh, and, uh, and, and to advance a humanistic agenda are so important for, for realising, for trying to tackle the very real challenges that we have in relation to unsustainable development, uh, the problems of climate change, of developing sustainable cities and so on. And um, we, we all, we've also heard over the last two days the potential for transdisciplinary approaches in terms of advancing principles of epistemic justice if we're serious about uh, realizing uh, sustainable and just futures together. And of course, it's uh, one of the things that, uh, that I was asked to do was to just have a look at, at UNESCO policy going back, but also at some of the work of our existing chairs and networks in relation to transdisciplinarity. And I wanted to share some of those insights with you. And it's quite clear that UNESCO, you know, since, since the inception of the, the program, uh, the UNESCO Chairs and Unitwin program has been committed to interdisciplinarity. It was written in, in fact, in the, the, the very founding documents uh, for, for the program. But UNESCO, for the, at least a quarter of a century, has also been advocating transdisciplinary approaches. So uh, one quote from 1998, addressing global and complex issues requires a qualitative, not just quantitative shift. This shift characterizes integration of knowledge is a direct outcome of the redefinition of the object of study. This framework constitutes the theoretical background of a transdisciplinary dimension. So that, that's from, uh, that, that's from a, a UNESCO uh, document on research going right back to 1998. More recently, uh, some of the national commissions have very explicitly endorsed a transdisciplinary approach. Um, the Italian Commission, for example, uh, has, has, uh, have, has argued that um, integrated knowledge to be developed in a transdisciplinary environment and for co-created knowledge, adopting and experimenting with communities of knowledge and communities of practice in which all can contribute as knowledge carriers, fostering cooperative learning and the ethics of collective intelligence. And I think that captures the spirit very nicely of what we understand by humanistic transdisciplinary approach. And it's also reflected um, in, in many of the works of the chairs and networks, which I'll talk about in a moment. But of course, UNESCO chairs and networks are really well positioned to, to actually undertake transdisciplinary working by their very nature. Um, 
they, 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 for example, they occupy a strategic position in UNESCO's thinking as think tanks and bridge builders between different kinds of communities. So it's in our very DNA as UNESCO chairs, as Unitwin networks, to undertake this kind of work, to lead on this kind of work. But we also, as UNESCO chairs and Unitwin networks, straddle different domains of knowledge production, uh, including the academic domain, but also the public domain, where indigenous and other kinds of local knowledge systems reside, and the private domain, uh, which of course is increasingly influential in terms of, of knowledge production. Of course, these domains are also marked by inequality, and one of the things that UNESCO chairs and Unitwin networks need to address are ways of trying to transcend some of these inequalities within the academic domain, for example, between institutions in the global north and the global south, but also between academic and non-academic practitioners, but also in an increasingly privatized world to try and, and, uh, and, and, and argue, uh, argue for a knowledge commons uh, as well. Um, so there are several chairs and networks um, that, that are already leading in the area of transdisciplinarity. They range from topics such as peace and human development, which, uh, which is an Italian chair and actually has transdisciplinarity in its title, in its very title, uh, to, to topics such as um, transformative African futures, which is a new, a new, a new chair based in South Africa, uh, a Unitwin network on humanitarian engineering, um, on understanding of sustainability, uh, chairs on integration of refugees, on sustainable cities, on sustainable oceans, on, uh, on, on multi multilingual diversity, on community-based research, on language policies, on adult education, and in my area, in quality education. And that's just a few. I think, you know, if, I think there's, there's a really important job of work to be done to really look at what the chairs are doing. And I think in terms of the way forward, and I'll stop here with just three suggestions of how we might take this agenda forward. But one might be to, to think about how we can learn from the existing work of chairs and, and networks in this area. There's a wealth of expertise in this room, in this very room. And we can synthesize and share that knowledge and successful practice of transdisciplinary working. There's perhaps also, um, that there's also scope as well, perhaps for UNESCO, seeing as it is revising its guidelines at the moment for the establishment of chairs and networks, to perhaps think about how transdisciplinary, transdisciplinarity could be reflected in those, those guidelines, but also in the way that, that our work is evaluated. I think up until this point, most of the internal and external evaluations of our work have focused largely on operational issues. Wouldn't it be great if there was some sort of uh, analysis, meta-analysis, of how we're working in transdisciplinary and co-creative ways. And it might be that, that there's scope for the establishment of a new Unitwin network, potentially, that could act as a kind of uh, 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 observatory, really, in this kind of space. Uh, many of our existing chairs and networks at the moment are focused on particular themes. But given the, the topic of this conference over the last two days, I wonder what a network that focused on the nature of knowledge and of research itself uh, might be able to contribute uh, to, to the ongoing work of, of UNESCO. So I'll, I'll stop there, Sobi, to give others a chance, but hopefully that's uh, helpful. Uh, very helpful. Thank you so much, um, uh, Leon. Um, and you're almost reading our minds a little. Um, in proposing initially a global observatory on transdisciplinarity, but maybe as is the focus of our conference, knowledge, the way we define it, the way we generate it, the way we uh, uh, mobilize around that. Um, perhaps just one thing to say, I mean, good to see that the transdisciplinarity is already there. 
What we are certainly lacking in going towards a global uh, um, observatory, whether it's a network uh, within, the, within the program that's, that, that serves that function, what we are lacking and what we are working on is a platform. We need a public engagement platform uh, that, that, uh, that allows uh, to make, uh, or facilitates at least, uh, the connections. If not, we're in an observatory which, uh, which finally would be a simple repository of, of what people are doing. But a dynamic uh, platform is something that we absolutely need. And speaking of dynamics, Rajesh, if you have a microphone, if not, I'll give you this one. There's an interesting conversation, very recent, and a dynamic of mobilization that, that we'd love to hear about. Sure, sure. Thank you, uh, Sobi, and thank you, colleagues. Um, we are part of a UNESCO co-chair my co-chair, Dr. Badhal, of University of Victoria, Canada, is not here. Uh, I am based in Priya in New Delhi in India. Um, when we began our UNESCO chair in 2012, immediately after the 2009 second UNESCO Higher Education Conference in this building, we began with trepidation and little hesitancy because our work on community-based research goes back to late 1970s. But we saw an opportunity in the second higher education conference where the declaration talked about indigenous knowledge. It talked about partnership beyond the world of academe. And it talked about education for sustainability. In the last two years, all of us have come across some very promising reports and conversations led by UNESCO. I am referring to the Futures Report, which has been tabled once again yesterday, Futures of Education Report, a new social contract. Reimagining. Some of us uh, have been involved in conversations on open science for the last two and a half years more intensively. And in that conversation, the unanimous recommendation on open science approved by member states. In May, in Barcelona, we had the third World Higher Education Conference. Many of you and us, we were there. And the declaration from that conference talked about the importance of a roadmap beyond limits. In preparation for that conference, there was an expert group report which gave specific suggestions about how higher education can more actively contribute to sustainable futures. In the World Higher Education Conference, for the first time, we had a number of submissions and a whole series of panels on indigenous knowledge contribution to higher education. And these various reports and their recommendations for us resonated so much in the spirit of the work that our UNESCO chair was doing. And then we arrived here and yesterday morning's plenary began to talk about those issues which are there in these reports. However, in the last six months, we have been interacting with colleagues in our countries but beyond our UNESCO chair network now encompasses 18 countries, including countries of the Global South. And we realize that very few of our colleagues have actually understood, analyzed, or even discussed these recommendations and these reports. 
So in the last few weeks, as UNESCO chair, we have been in conversation with several of you who are here. We have been in conversation with uh, associations. We have been in conversation with UNESCO chair that Leon has been part of. We have been in conversation with uh, Canadian Commission for UNESCO, with GUNI, with Tellerist Network. There are a number of very strong networks focusing on higher education. And I am standing here today remembering what Federico Mayor mentioned yesterday morning, that in his vision, UNESCO chairs were a network of hope. And it is that hope which I want to share with you, that as UNESCO chair, can we join hands to take forward the messages in these wonderful reports and recommendations to our own colleagues in higher education systems in our country, to our own networks, to our own academic institutions, to our national policymakers and national commissions. A conversation that will enable them to understand what these recommendations are all about, how they can be analyzed in their own institutional and national context, and what actions they can take to transform higher education for a just and sustainable future. We believe that as a collection of recommendations, there is a convergence now which requires new energy and new outreach by higher education institutions. These recommendations taken together are not only talking about multiple epistemologies and new ways of integrating knowledge, but also inviting higher education institutions to engage with societal actors more actively and more respectfully. And I think this is an opportunity, therefore, for us as a UNESCO chair fraternity to take these conversations in our networks over the next year or so, so that we can prepare the ground for changes that need to be made in our own institutions, in our own national policy frameworks, and those of the various funding agencies in our countries and internationally. If we do that, perhaps we will place higher education as an important agenda in the summit of the futures, which is likely to be held in 2024. Because while the Secretary General of the United Nations made a very important declaration in the recently held education summit in the UN in September, higher education was not a main focus of that summit, as I understand. So I would appeal to all of you to join this invitation to individually and collectively take forward these recommendations as a set, these reports, through our networks, through our associations, through our own platforms that most of our UNESCO chairs have, most of our unit twin networks have, to enable deeper conversation about these transformative recommendations that have come together in the last two years, and then prepare the ground so that we come to UN Summit of the Futures in 2024 with a strong base for transforming higher education, its teaching, research, and societal engagement agenda. So that is my appeal to you. It is not a proposal to create a new network or anything like that, but to bring to your attention that the messages we have been hearing since yesterday morning and in many of the workshops that we all have been participating in, there is a coherence in the urgency for transforming higher education institutions and higher education policies in our countries so that it can play a meaningful role towards a just and sustainable future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Rajas Tandon, for this uh, invitation to mobilize across what is, 
what is the extended family of UNESCO. UNESCO is often referred to as the inter intellectual agency within the UN system. And we do have a broad mandate in all these important areas. And this is really an invitation, platform or no platform, to mobilize and to engage and to help, um, uh, to help engage the various constituencies in the spaces in which you work and have an influence on some of the important outcomes. On the second point, also referring to the Transforming Education Summit, true that there was very little, almost no reference to research, innovation, and higher education in the vision statement that came out of the Transforming Education Summit. However, the national statements of commitment, and we have analyzed them through various angles, um, in 40% of cases did bring out the importance of higher education institutions in, as, as, as uh, hubs for, uh, uh, for uh, creativity, innovation, and, and responding uh, to the challenges across, across education systems. I'd now like to bring in, um, so thank you very much, Rajesh, for that. I'd like to bring in now uh, the Italian experience um, first. And, 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 and then we will, uh, we will where, where we have a, a combination of, uh, of Professor Bianchi and the, sec, and, uh, and, the, and the National Commission and then come to you. Interesting experience from Italy. What, you can come up here or, or feel free to remain um, to speak from your seat. Thank you, Professor Bianchi. Thank you so much. Let me thank you, UNESCO and the French delegation to have organized this celebration of 30 years of uh, UNESCO chairs. It's important to celebrate anniversary because it's putting ourselves, our work, our day-by-day -day work in an historic perspective. The historic perspective is necessary to us to understand that we are moving toward an historic result. When we say that, uh, and we say that in New York, that we have to transform education, to transform the world, it's clear that uh, we have as a final goal what uh, we can say, a society that is just, that is uh, able to provide to everybody in the world the capacity, the resources, the ideas to have a sustainable environment, society, and the economy. Let me ask to myself, but also to you, in this gigantic movement, which is the role of UNESCO chairs, what are you doing here? Why we are here? Which kind of activity can we provide for this uh, global movement to transform the world? I feel that it's extremely important what we are doing because we can act as the basic infrastructure of this global movement. Basic infrastructure means that we can provide a global network of people enrooted at local level. So, in other words, we are able to connect the two tendencies from the top down because we have to convince government to invest more and more in education and the bottom-up flow, that is, we have to convince our society to invest more and more in education. For this reason, I believe that it's extremely important that we take in account the possibility to work together we have a great, great consensus. I listened these two days that all we agree about uh, not only the need of cooperate, but also to the roadmap to transform education. We are speaking about uh, transdisciplinary activities. That means to look to become complementary. It's not just a matter of uh, integration. It's a matter of to become complementary. That means to adjust our knowledge in order to transform what I know, what you know, what we know in a different kind of knowledge. 
But you know that there is a real problem among us. We can share knowledge if we trust you. There is a matter of trust. We have to stress that the role of UNESCO Chair's network is to recreate trust in this untrustful world. For this reason, it is necessary to also to account the experiences, to, to take the experiences on how can we cooperate, the experiences on how can we put together our knowledge to create a new sentiment, a new knowledge, a new capacity. Also, to have very clear that we are not here to the forecast the future, but we are here to build the future. We are here because we are active builder of the new world. For this reason, let me give the floor to Professor Raimondo Caggiano di Osavedo. He is the coordinator of our experience of dialogue. We call our experience of cooperation dialogo. Think what a beautiful word. Dialogo means to share the world to have together the responsibility to have the shared knowledge, not for us, but for our people. Don't forget it, that we are not here simply because we are interested to transform the university or to transform primary school. We know that working on schools, working on our children, working on our young people, working on our, ourselves, we are serving the best public good that we have now in the world. It is transforming the world to have uh, justice, equality, and democracy. Thank you. Good afternoon, and I will uh, speak to you as the uh, spokesperson of a network of about 40 uh, uh, Italian UNESCO chairs, but just like the previous uh, uh, speaker, I can only uh, recognize uh, the quality of uh, this, the, 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 the moderation of these uh, discussions. And in fact, uh, we can certainly thank UNESCO making such effective arrangements. But as uh, Madame Giannini said, this uh, is our chance through UNESCO to take stock and exchange notes. Now, Dialogic is, of course, uh, the project we've been developing in Italy. Its um, inception is rather unusual. It is, in a way, uh, a form of spontaneous generation. Uh, there was uh, no need for regulation, for uh, any kind of uh, statement by university deans. It is, in a way, um, the child of the pandemic, because, uh, of course, d before the pandemic, we organized uh, weekly meetings of the national commissions, and, and we had to change uh, ways of, of, of operating. But, of course, um, when we found there was a, an urgent need to, uh, to exchange on many issues, then we decided to uh, <clears throat> have um, a sort of a constant platform for exchange, making it possible for each chair uh, with uh, its uh, respective, with their respective constituencies, having a chance to communicate. Well, the UNESCO chairs, uh, of course, uh, propose to, uh, to, to, to communicate, but the, the, the idea here is to uh, put all the, the, the knowledge and the, the legacy of the Italian network, making it uh, accessible to all through uh, webinars uh, or uh, other uh, uh, platforms, um, looking at themes that were examined over, uh, over the years. Now, the first uh, big theme was the sustainability of education. That program was taken up by all the chairs, by all the Italian UNESCO chairs. And in a few days, there will be um, a special uh, report uh, taking stock, uh, looking at the uh, outcomes of uh, that experiment, where we 
as I said, uh, compared notes. And indeed, that experiment was so successful that it was repeated for the year 2022-2023. Uh, this time, the, the new uh, theme, well, is uh, known because it was inspired by UNESCO. It is the new social contract for education. And But the novelty there is that each uh, chair will have to turn to another chair of the wet work to uh, jointly organize uh, various uh, uh, aspects of the work and uh, find ways of uh, cooperating around these issues. And so uh, we've only we've uh, just uh, started doing this. But as Pope Francis in Rome recommended in, in uh, his uh, pastoral letter, Querida Amazonia, uh, when there are issues development, you have to move on to uh, the, uh, the higher stage. Uh, we may refer to this as a subsidiarity, but here we call it the, the, the next stage or the, the higher stage. In any case, the purpose there is to look at the merits of the issues. And so the first thing is to discuss, to uh, arrive at uh, conclusions uh, that need to be adopted. So uh, that is what we call the Declaration on Education. But that document was unanimously adopted. We are all academics. And uh, you know, it is a pretty difficult thing to, to get uh, uh, two chairs to, uh, to agree. Two chairs uh, is um, difficult enough. Three chairs, almost impossible. But 40 chairs is standard to medical. But yet, there we are. The document was presented in Dubai at the Universal uh, Ex Exposition and here in Paris again at the meetings we had last year and in Barcelona as well. Um, and, uh, and indeed, our uh, lead ministries uh, where in France, uh, 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 where we had Minister uh, Bianchi, uh, uh, Minister of Education. Anyway, uh, we, we got approval uh, at the highest level. And then we decided to go one step further and decided to uh, organize uh, all this, not under, uh, say, the stewardship of a, uh, an association or uh, some form of regulatory body, but rather a sort of club bringing together uh, the uh, the the chair holders of the forty chairs, but that would be that was a very informal, very light structure. A secretariat, of course, to uh, to carry the the, the, the program, uh, a form of um, uh, a dialogue. No, I'm not the one in charge. Somebody else will. Um, but uh, the work continues uh, through bi-monthly meetings. Uh, now. Uh, Unlike, uh, I mean, this is, the, the meetings have been held very punctually. That's not very Italian, but we've managed to do this, taking stock and developing uh, new ideas. But of course, each uh, chair, each UNESCO chair, uh, is in a, is in a position to make all its, uh, as it were, heritage available to uh, all the others. But working on the common framework. And the last point is that we were able to reach out outside um, Italy. We worked with our German friends. We uh, shared the Jena and Wuppertal declarations. And here, and right here in Paris, and thank you again for this opportunity, we are working with uh, Latin America on um, the dissemination of this uh, uh, dialogue program in other countries. So these programs are easily exported. Uh, up until now, about 5,000 people were involved, uh, but uh, that is something individual chairs is not in a position to achieve. But uh, of course, joining forces uh, made that possible. And uh, and that takes me to the very last point. Uh, um, it's not just a spontaneous generation. I mean, what was spontaneous was the work. Of course, it's uh, uh, volunteer work, but uh, it's uh, organized on a uh, rotation basis. So whenever a commission is in charge, uh, the uh, new uh, secretariat uh, uh, comes to take over. Uh, so, uh, and by the way, it is not true that young people and academics do not want to get involved. No, they do, and we do provide the necessary services to make uh, that uh, dialogue program work. And one last note, we do not propose to uh, build a new Eiffel Tower. However, uh, we will have a new stage in the near future. Thank you. Merci. Well, thank you. These are two fine examples of uh, spontaneous efforts, but that's, but of course, that's what is needed here: we, uh, uh, agility, creativity, 
and, and, and uh, this, of course, happens because of uh, uh, of a strong commitment. Before I give the floor to, oh, hang on, uh, we, we we've heard, of course, from uh, 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 Enrico and Raimondo uh, they told us about the uh, the experience, and. Um, Leon Tickley's analysis uh, gave us some insight into uh, the work done uh, on the wider scale. The, the paper is available, by the way. You can get an email copy as well. In any event, let me give the floor to Alexander Navarro, who is the uh, Secretary General of the French uh, National Commission and, of course, our partner for this meeting. Thank you, sir. Let me uh, uh, give this presentation seen from the viewpoint of the National Commissions. And so, uh, but of course, starting with the French National Commission, but then uh, we'll have a, a presentation of the Polish National Commission, and they will report on the exchanges that took place this morning between uh, national commissions. But uh, let me uh, remind you what is the, the primary objective of this program, and that is uh, inter-university international cooperation. And so uh, that's uh, why uh, the chairs were involved. It was actually clearly presented here. Let me just, uh, well, remind you that the, well, the, the national commissions supported uh, these nominations uh, the chair nominations uh, at UNESCO with a view to uh, including their work uh, uh, or including in uh, their work the UNESCO priorities on gender and Africa and well north-south cooperation was very much uh, discussed but it is very much for national commissions when we receive an application when we receive uh, a, 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 a and a project or a proposal, see how this can happen as part of a strengthened cooperation with the Global South. That's one thing. North-South. And then the other aspect is gender equality. Uh, and that is something when, when applications, when, uh, when uh, projects are being uh, uh, presented, we want to make sure that this, this, uh, the gender aspect must be taken on board. And th that is something that UNESCO will look into because, uh, well, the UNESCO chairs uh, should uh, uh, be, to a large extent, what should include more women. Uh, that is something that is uh, uh, still, that still needs to be developed. Now, that's one thing. But the other thing is, of course, working uh, as a network, uh, theme by theme. Well, that was uh, clearly presented just now by the Italian uh, uh, commission, but then between networks, and that would uh, reinforce what was said earlier on. You have relations between UNESCO chairs. You have the learning cities. We have the associated schools. So these are uh, uh, networks that can work together. But uh, uh, the UN family uh, works on the on the world courage, uh, world heritage, uh, cultural, uh, natural heritage intangible heritage, uh, biodiversity. There are many uh, uh, projects that are happening now where national commissions uh, can be uh, very effectively involved, but uh, uh, not just internationally, but of course on the national level, because of course national commissions are, are there to make things happen locally uh, on the ground to establish connections with various uh, uh, UNESCO actors uh, that are uh, present in the field. And then the UNESCO chairs will need to be uh, better included in the C4 or C5 uh, document, the uh, uh, strategic decisions, the uh, the priorities of UNESCO, the, uh, the program of work and, and budget, uh, because, uh, of course, uh, UNESCO brings together a, a vast uh, wealth of competences. and. Uh, and indeed, that was, uh, again, in, in, in this year's timetable, we saw that the major world conferences were organized by UNESCO. And on all of these conferences, the UNESCO's chairs were very much present and indeed uh, uh, were uh, involved in a very active way earlier this year on higher education. Then the World uh, Conference on Cultural Policy with Mondia Cult. Uh, there's the com conference on, on childhood. You can see that on all these occasions, the UNESCO chairs are very uh, deeply uh, involved uh, in the programs and indeed in the way in which these programs will be conducted. And then finally, 
and it, it is uh, it's the great strength of the uh, of the UNESCO chairs network to have this interdisciplinary bond between uh, chairs and uh, and so if we're trying to build sort of a global observatory of that interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary approach the transformation or trans transformative uh, knowledge means transforming the application of knowledge and the dissemination of knowledge. It's not so much the knowledge itself uh, that is transformed, but the way in which it is disseminated and implemented. And there, the observatory of an, uh, well, this uh, interdisciplinary observatory, uh, which we uh, suggested, uh, should start going now. We shouldn't wa have to wait until the next anniversary to get together on the global scale. Such a platform of uh, reinforced discussion should be uh, uh, the way for us to make uh, concrete proposals to UNESCO, or at least to be active participants uh, in the UNESCO programs. But the, the idea, again, there is uh, to share uh, not, not only knowledge but experience. That's what the uh, network is all about. And a global observatory is, I think, the strong message that comes out of that 30th anniversary that really can exemplify the uh, role of UNESCO as an intellectual player in uh, multilateral cooperation. Now, for those chairs that wish to extend to continue the discussion uh, and work on this concept of an observatory, we're more than happy to work with them because it's the sort of thing we, we would like uh, to make it happen. Having sort of this global network um, engaged in that uh, in that reflection. Indeed, some proposals have come to the fore, and uh, I'll mention one before giving the floor to the N Polish National Commission. There's the idea of organizing in 2023 um, a conference on the, uh, engineering and uh, and, uh, and new technologies proposed by the the Science University of Krakow in Poland. So that's an example right there uh, how we can bring substance to uh, a, a global network, a, uh, an exchange mechanisms, an observatory that can uh, oversee the, the, the work of uh, the UNESCO chairs, reinforcing UNESCO's intellectual role in multilateral cooperation. Thank you so much. I'll now give the floor to the Polish National Commission, uh, and they will present the outcome of their uh, work with national commissions. Thank you for giving me the voice. Uh, I would like just to deliver a short report on the outcomes from the session of national commissions. Uh, the session was organized today. Uh, it's not the first time we, uh, between national commissions, debate how can we facilitate the process uh, of uh, um, applications and uh, submitting proposals, but also how to, um, how to encourage and support UNESCO chairs in their everyday uh, functioning. Uh, so, uh, yesterday, uh, Director General said um, that UNESCO uh, chairs, UNITWIN networks constitute uh, a unique platform uh, and, uh, in, the, in this multilateral system, so we should keep it unique. Uh, therefore, uh, we discussed the number of chairs and the new select selection measures, which are offered and were revised and launched in March 2022. Uh, we discussed how, uh, given different capacities and, uh, and uh, work, uh, workforce uh, when it comes to uh, national commissions, how can we at the national level support the, the project, not only by giving recommendations. Uh, we discussed, uh, obviously, the work on transversal priorities of UNESCO, Africa and gender equality. Mm, we found also that uh, this new selection system uh, mm, should act for cooperation with the South and, to en and we should encourage UNESCO chairs, especially chairs from the North, to collaborate with, uh, with the chairs worldwide from the South-South cooperation. Um, and during our, uh, our uh, meeting, uh, also the point of global observatory was raised. Uh, Mm, that should be uh, kind of a uh, result of networking uh, and exchange that is already uh, ongoing. Uh, 
um, perhaps there should be an entity uh, created where the heads and experts uh, from chairs uh, would be uh, would be involved parallel to this or maybe something that could be complementary uh, is uh, the idea of international uh, committee that would uh, gather uh, UNESCO chairs uh, uh, so that they could um, exchange their practices and creating new uh, partnerships. Um, we discussed um, as well uh, the activities of UNESCO chairs because UNESCO chair is a research but also something that can be measured. And we all know it's measured uh, when we uh, read the re uh, reports, mid-term and final reports. Therefore, we, um, we discussed, um, uh, we, um, we debated on um, exchanges uh, and uh, encouraging cooperation between UNESCO chairs, UNESCO chairholders, but other UNESCO networks. Uh, by this, we meant uh, UNESCO ASP Net schools, um, as well as uh, UNESCO Creative Cities. Uh, from from what I saw today, the the side event on ASP Net schools uh, uh, was full of people. So I believe that this is this is a new new step uh, cooperation between ASP Net and. Um, uh, and UNESCO, uh, UNESCO uh, chairs. Um, last but not least, we want to underline the role of national commissions uh, when it comes to navigation and intellectual support and cooperation with, um, uh, with uh, experts in order to, um, to provide uh, the right navigation for uh, future shareholders in terms of uh, giving them direction what are the UNESCO priorities and objectives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all for sharing your insights, your experiences, sharing your, your commitments and your engagement. And, and very promising and hopeful to see uh, these dynamics and, and, and this commitment. There is a lot to build on, but we do have to come together better as a community. We did mention platform that is essential uh, to have a space and uh, um, uh, uh, a space and, uh, and uh, to, to, to interact um, and, and to build on our experiences. But great to hear this. Now we'd like to move to um, some insights from UNESCO senior leadership. Uh, so thank you very much once again. And I invite ADG Education, Stefania Giannini and her colleagues. Uh, Stefania will be moderating and colleagues and their representatives to give us their, their insight. Just waiting for some colleagues. Good afternoon. Great to see you once again. I got the, the wrong room before, but also this room is very, very nice. And, uh, and uh, I mean, thanks, uh, first of all, to my colleagues uh, who are here with, uh, with me. Almost all of them, uh, I'm sure that uh, we can start, if you don't mind. The idea is to present uh, the uni twin UNESCO chairs as it is. Not an education program, but a UNESCO flagship, which absolutely is uh, a common responsibility, a common good between uh, all of us, uh, and uh, which uh, can benefit from the unique strength of this organization. To have in the same building, in the same house, science, Shamila, my dear friend, ADG, science, uh, culture, the pillar of the house, Ernesto, uh, ADG culture, uh, Marielsa, who's representing ADG CI, CI and information, as you already mentioned, uh, 
is an important uh, sector which has to do with very timely important challenges and opportunities in uh, communication and information. Um, I suppose, uh, sorry, Surya representing uh, Gabriela Ramos, who is the uh, ADG for uh, social sciences, the other part of the S, I would say. Uh, Vladimir ADG uh, IOS, the sector which is focusing on OCEAN, because UNESCO is also the organization hosting the Intergovernmental OCEAN um, Observatory, right? Organization, uh, more or less, yes, but an important body which is in charge, especially in this decade for OCEAN, to protect and to promote. Uh, 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 Ocean as a common good. And last but not least, and going back through the first row, uh, Eduardo, uh, Edu, sorry, I just, <laughs> he speaks Italian better than me, uh, uh, among many other languages. Uh, Eduard uh, Matoko was uh, uh, the uh, uh, ADG uh, External Relation and Priority Africa. So, the idea now is to give the floor to all of them uh, and uh, please uh, uh, explain uh, your vision uh, on the future and the uh, strength of this uh, our common program that education as a sector has uh, simply the, the, the duty and uh, the privilege to host. But this is a common job. Thank you very much. And then I will wrap. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Stefania. Dear friends, dear colleagues, first let me tell you what a great pleasure and what an honor it is to be facing such a vast diversity in the shareholders from the entire world. As Ashil Mbembe was saying only yesterday, you are the people who, whose task it is to think the future and transform the future, which is the title of this forum. I do hope that at the end of these two days of discussions, we've managed to produce something, produce something that it will be positive not only for UNESCO, but for all those, particularly students and young people, who, who trust us and who believe that we have solutions to bring them to build the future. As uh, ADG for Priority Africa and External Relations, I, I'd like to insist on Priority Africa. We were able to organize yesterday an event in coordination with the African chairs as well as other chairs to explain what Priority Africa is all about, particularly explaining some flagship programs which are under the responsibility of the education sector, but other uh, uh, flagship programs are very important for the UNESCO uh, chairs. I, I'm, I'm talking about the uh, Campus Africa program. and. All these uh, programs being cross-sectorial, they, they, that means developing capacities for the managing of uh, world heritage, open sciences, dissemination of science and technology, etc., etc. Of course, including in artificial intelligence, which is basically the fifth industrial revolution, which Africa is going to have to be a part of. So we really are relying on the UNESCO chairs. You need to support us in this work for raising awareness, but but also for implementing in the field some projects that are going to raise hope among young people all over the world and in Africa in particular, because they're more than 60% of the population of the continent. So thank you again for being part of that. Thank you for bringing us here at the Secretariat some some uh, some chance of 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 thinking beyond our our home bureaucracy and 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 looking out at the world thank you again thank you very much edouard and thank you stefania dear colleagues excellencies Dear UNESCO chairs, it truly is a pleasure to be here before you representing the sector of natural and exact sciences I would particularly like to thank the and, and congratulate the education sector. Uh, thank you, Stefania, and, and thank her team for having managed to convene this this uh, meeting. Uh, 
chairs really are the future of UNESCO, for science in particular. It's a way to promote peace, to promote a vision of peace. This requires a, the, the, the combining of education, science, culture, uh, and education. We, uh, we, we know how important it is for all these chairs to work together over, all over the world. When you're talking about science nowadays, you, you, can, uh, you can only be crucially aware of how, m how huge the fractures are between uh, the various parts of the world. We need to mobilize expertise, and the chairs of UNESCO are going to have to play a very important role in this sharing out of information and know-how. In in the spirit of diversity, I'm now going to move over to English. So sector, excellencies, shareholders, and dear UNITWIN UNESCO chair programs. We, we are delighted to inform you here today that we have 255 UNESCO chairs covering all regions of the world for the natural sciences, linking science, people, and society. But beyond sharing expertise, these uh, UNESCO chairs are very important, and they enhance knowledge for climate action, biodiversity, water, ocean management, disaster risk reduction, advancing international cooperation in science, technology, and innovation. Edouard, the ADG PAX, has talked about the fourth industrial revolution, artificial intelligence. It's not possible without science, technology, and innovation. So our sector, really, the natural sciences, your sector is ready to continue to work with you to develop joint activities. Now, we also want to engage and develop concrete science collaborations with all of UNESCO's chairs, because we must pursue the organization's priorities, the global priorities, Africa and gender, but other priority groups, small island developing states, and women. We want to ensure that women and girls fully participate in UNESCO's action to tackle climate change, to access the advances in science, technology, and innovation. Now, before concluding, I want to recall the five milestones that were actually designed at UNESCO's international conference with UNESCO chairs in the natural science sector five years ago. These are still our guiding principles for collaborations with UNITWIN, and that is prioritizing our work, networking like this, expertise and information, advocating and communicating, monitoring and reporting on giant actions. Now, just very briefly, uh, the 255 chairs in natural science sector, uh, we have them in different parts of the world. And I would say that um, a very good group of chairs across the world who are working to promote the natural sciences. Uh, disaster risk reduction is really critical to the world today. And the world must have tools and methodologies to address the disasters, whether they floods, droughts, um, even the impact of climate change. So we'd like to see more of disaster risk reduction chairs across the world. In the intergovernmental hydrological program, it's very important that we have more chairs. We have numerous chairs. Most of them are in the global north. And yet we know that over two billion people lack access to water and water security is the defining challenge of our times. So why not chairs in the global south? How can we promote that? We heard earlier on about an observatory for chairs. Could we create an observatory for developing country chairs for water so we can promote a water secure world and access science and technology and really the hydrological sciences for water secure world? This is the new theme of the IHP9 and we'd like to see you more engaged in this program. Of course, I've come here with the wish, wish list dear Stefania and colleagues, but I think it's very important to recall everybody, these are the programs of UNESCO and these are your programs and the role of the chairs. Now, for the basic science and engineering, it's very important that we have more chairs in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, education, but we need more chairs to lead on open science. UNESCO governing bodies approved a recommendation on open science last year, the 41st General Conference of UNESCO, to ensure that no one is left behind. How can we promote implementation of open science if we don't have chairs in open science, especially in the global south? 
We also want to see more women in science, and we'd like to see more chairs, women scientists in, 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 in holding these chairs. But I think we also need to have interdisciplinary science programs, measure the impact of science on societies, especially science education, impact on future of societies, and this is a joint collaboration which we have with the Dia Stefania. And I would like to say I want to wish you all a happy International Biodiversity Day. This was yesterday. It's 50 years since UNESCO started creating biosphere reserves. These are designated sites where people live in harmony with nature. They monitor nature. They live off nature because the economic development depends on nature. How many chairs do we have? How can we promote sustainable environmental development? Well, we have designated sites, the biosphere reserves, but we also have the geoparks because geodiversity is the silent biodiversity partner. How can we ensure that we have geodiversity or geopark chairs in the global south and across the world to value earth sciences? So we would like to call here for chairs and ecosystem restoration, inclusive governance, human nature relationships, but we also want to see chairs on sustainable models of the biosphere reserves. No other organizations host biosphere reserves, as UNESCO does, where we monitor the decline in nature, biodiversity, impact of climate change, adaptation, but also restoring nature. So I want to thank you sincerely, and once again, congratulations to Stefania and her team for bringing us here together, and thank you to the chairs. Thank you very much. So, so, maybe, maybe it will work. Yes, we are back. So, uh, well, welcome to all. It's a big pleasure. As a former professor, it's always great to see academia present in, in UNESCO, as you know. In the culture sector, as you may know, we have 120 chairs. UNESCO chairs. Um, those chairs are dedicated specifically on very broader uh, networks and subjects. We're talking about world heritage protection. We are talking you know, about living heritage safeguarding, the promotion of sustainable tourism, the protection and promotion of the diversity of cultural expressions, underwater cultural heritage, cultural policies, and culture and sustainable urban development. Well, if you see what has been the chairs in the culture sector eight years ago, they're all based and specifically on heritage. But today we have two big new issues that are raising more and more. The first is what you had the opportunity yesterday to, to exchange with our teams was on governance of the cultural convention. And as you know, UNESCO in the cultural sector is known and renowned because of its uh, convention and recommendation. But the culture sector it's far much as only the instrument, normative instrument that we have. And today, the two big challenges that I mentioned was uh, what you had the opportunity yesterday to hear on culture in emergencies. As you can imagine, today we are very focusing, not only in Europe, but in all regions of the world, to see how the different uh, thematic unity network dedicated to culture and emergency or through the creation of new platforms to share to, 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 to share research, expertise, good practices and tools can give an opportunity to UNESCO to concentrate more effort in analyzing. One of the big issues that we have in the culture sector is a lack of data. And you know very well that each time that we have to take or decision makers have to take decisions to ensure that we are all uh, getting the response that we need 
and the financial support that we need, we need data. And the only way to do it is by having analysis of the work that we are doing. That's something that we are really, really keen to continue because you, as UNESCO Chair, are the one that give us the support to continue our work, knowing that member states somehow are not financing a lot of this work that we need to support what we are doing. And I mention it because in last, it was 27, 28 of September, we had this conference that we waited 40 years to organize called Mondia Cult in Mexico City. There were 10 uh, chairs, UNESCO chairs present at this meeting. And that's how uh, you, you could learn from it. We had 150 ministers of culture that made a very powerful declaration in one year or there was no possibility to have any declaration on a consensual basis. And we achieved in the culture sector for a simple reason, because the urgency of the matters that we are discussing cannot wait. And as the different sectors that are represented here, either education, communication, or science, are crucial for the decision makers, to, the makers today to put in place the right solution or the best solution possible for what is waiting for us in the next years, either, either a pandemic, a new pandemic, or uh, a new crisis, climate change, climate crisis, uh, environmental uh, disasters that are coming more and more often, or even wars. So why am I mentioning Mondiacul? Because one of the major outcomes that came out is that today we are all, uh, we are all behind what was defined culture as a glo uh, go global common good. And it means that we have to work for the next eight years, not only to ensure the advocacy for this, but to reach some something that we were not able in 2015, is that when we are talking about the goals for a future uh, sustainable development agenda, culture should exist as one goal and not anymore represented as part of all the other goals as it has been until now. And for this, we have to work a lot in the next eight years. And I believe that chairs will be the fundamental layer where we're going to be able to reach this consensus for all stakeholders. Today, we have been uh, endorsed by our member states that we should call for more inclusive and participatory cultural policies involving all the multiplicity of actors. And it is mentioned, academia. It's not like civil society, governments, local authorities. And at the end, they put the academia. They should be part of all our discussion and of all the solution. So we want to stress the support that we need of our chairs and networks that will be essential for the implementation of the results of this declaration. And particularly on subjects such, such as the linkage between culture and education. And I see the, our former ambassador of Portugal that is present. Portugal and South Korea were the principal 11 years ago. And today with Stefania and, uh, and all our teams, we are working together to have this conference next year, at the end of next year in uh, Abu Dhabi, to ensure that the framework that was established 11 years ago is revised and implemented with both ministry, ministerial level and to ensure that what we are working will give a new framework that will help us to build not only on art and education as it was 11 years ago, 
bet on culture and education, heritage and education. And in this sense, you will be the leading partners to achieve this uh, goal. Finally, and I will finish right now, we believe that uh, this conference was, Mondekult was essential for ensuring that today what we are working very hard on is on cultural rights. And when I speak about cultural rights, we are not talking only about human rights, that is this core mandate of UNESCO, but to ensure that the cultural rights of practitioners of a larger and broader audience is well represented, have aware of their rights and how to implement that. And in this sense, we are very um, waiting to be sure that you will be part of the discussions for the next months and years to come. Note finally that uh, the culture sector looks forward to strengthening our collaboration with all the chairs and networks on all these topics and more going forward all together. So thank you once again for having this opportunity to share with you. And we hope really that the share will be at the core of what we are doing, not only at the advocacy level, but also on the ground level, as we are capable to endorse all the discussion together. Thank you so much for allowing us to be part of this great discussions. Thank you. Hello? Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, let me start by first uh, thanking very much uh, the team, uh, you know, first at ADG, uh, Education, Stefania Giannini, and the entire team that manages the fantastic, extraordinary um, Unit Win uh, program, uh, which brings uh, the communication and information sector close to 100 chairs uh, in areas as diverse as media and information literacy, artificial intelligence, open education resources, data science, uh, gender studies, um, ICTs, media studies, journalism education, and so on and so forth. Those are absolutely essential topics, and we are incredibly happy to count on the expertise that these chairs provide uh, to communications and information sector. Um, in this two, you know, two days, you know, yesterday and today, we held uh, parallel sessions on information as a public good and on the flow of ideas in the digital age. Those are important topics, and the discussions highlighted the absolute power of uh, digital technologies and the transformations uh, that it is being catalyzing in the lives of everyone. Um, we re recalled, for example, that uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, two years ago, 20% more people joined the, the internet, you know, 782 you know, million new users. Um, and of course, these new users didn't join before, not because they didn't find value on that, but because they didn't have the capacity or the resource to do so. Um, so, you know, in spite of all that, we still have um, enormous digital divides that are basically on two different areas. One of those is the issues of uh, access to information. And access to information, the meaningful access uh, to uh, digital ecosystems and spaces, is not just about connectivity and about infrastructure, which is not exactly our mandate specifically, but the fact that uh, once even those that are connected sometimes are unable to derive value from being on the internet, on being on digital ecosystems, simply because they do not speak one of the languages, one of the few languages that are available in digital ecosystems. 7,061 active languages in the world, less than 300 on the internet. Um, the same thing for persons with disabilities and that lack accessibility and the assistive devices that enable them to participate on an equal basis uh, on these kinds of ecosystems. The other aspect of, uh, of the digital divides that we see is absolutely the lack of capacity to engage, you know, uh, meaningfully and equally uh, in 
the conversations and they are fostered through uh, digital ecosystems on the exchanges of data, of information, of ideas, and so on and so forth. So the flow of ideas is not you know, benefiting everyone equally, and that's the a concerning, concerning element uh, that was put uh, together. Some of our experts that participated in our discussions highlighted the fact that uh, even though we are more connected, that we are actually you know, more productive and we're actually more resilient because of the existence of uh, digital technologies, communication and information technologies. In fact, we are also more divided. And this divisiveness comes through, you know, because information ecosystems tend to be quite polluted, you know, by different types of misinformation, disinformation, hate speech, radicalization messages, um, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So the fact that we need you know, to not only clean up uh, and, uh, and um, um, seed our information ecosystems with good, reliable information, but also to build capacities of people to participate on an equal basis, particularly those that are left behind through the various types of divides, rural, urban, you know, gender divides, uh, you know, and so on and so forth, are, are, is an enormous call that has rallied the support of incredible universities from, and just let me cite some of the countries that were present. I, I'm not gonna make the whole list, but uh, Bulgaria, Canada, Finland, France, Italy, Mexico, Slovenia, South Africa, Tunisia, UK, Uruguay, US, the, you all showed up. You all showed up to this conference because you know it's incredibly important that we work together on an interdisciplinary basis to address the challenges that we face ahead of us. And these challenges are, you know, as you yourself highlighted, you want to take a different role. You don't see yourself as ivory tower research, you know, uh, 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 researchers and educators only, but you see yourselves as activists. And this is a fantastic, you know, uh, um, role that you claim, you know, our chairs claim for themselves, you know, for yourselves, uh, because you want to actually, you know, advocate for UNESCO's mandate. And the other thing that you made clear for us uh, uh, in that is that you want to act as coordinated, you know, in a coordinated uh, way, in a co as a cohesive unit, acting as a network. And this is one of the impulses that the communication and information sector uh, chairs have to come together, and ha they have come together under already an association that is a brilliant, uh, good practice that uh, we have offered also to the unit twin uh, um, um, secretariat and, and other colleagues, is that the Orbicom um, um, Association of uh, CI Chairs that brings together the, the entire network and in keeps that network informed. Uh, of uh, the different types of research opportunities and collaborative opportunities that exist. And the chairs have detected quite a lot that is going on you know, right now and that will be happening in the next three years and want to come together as a network, um, again, to offer their support. In the next three years, we are seeing a lot of action in the setting of standards in which, by which we should coexist um, in digital ecosystems in such a way that these systems are human rights based and really uh, benefit everyone, leaving no one behind. And these standards you know, will be set through, for example, next year, uh, when in February 2023, you, you know, UNESCO convenes a conference on regulation of internet platforms. We will count on the brains of our uh, chairs to provide inputs to this conference. Then, you know, of course, we will have on the 2024, also the uh, summit of the future where the global digital compact is going to, you know, to be uh, um, negotiated and presented and proposed to, you know, uh, to be adopted by member states. And of course, our chairs can provide evidence and research and inputs and insights into this. And then in 2025, we have the 20th year review 
of the World Summit for the Information Society, looking at uh, you know, what is the mandate going forward for the largest gathering uh, in, the, in the digital uh, spaces that, there is, that, that exists in the world. You know, so, of course, our chairs are actually also uh, um, um, ready to engage in that. So, you know, the, the amount of brain power and collaborative spirit that the, the chairs have brought uh, uh, to us is something that we need to celebrate and to really, you know, uh, um, uh, highlight. Um, you want to bring your insights and your ideas, you know, to transform them into, you know, facts and uh, that can then become evidence that reaches policymakers and enhance our capacity to make decisions in a world that's becoming much more turbulent and where challenges that we face require, you know, uh, uh, reliable evidence for us to tackle. So I, I will just close it now by saying, you know, it's a privilege to work with, you know, such committed, determined, you know, and expert chairs. And I would like to continue to see you and engage with you on a permanent basis so that you can really play your role as a network, as, as individual experts and as individual chairs in you know, establishing these standards that set the future for us in digital technology. So thank you so very much for being here. And thanks again to the marvelous uh, Unit Twin team that enables uh, uh, this network to go forward. Thank you. On behalf of the Assistant Director General for Social and Human Sciences, I wish to thank all the chairs that are present today and who have contributed in this very, very successful event conference. If there's one element that this conference has highlighted is the added value that UNESCO chairs represent for UNESCO as they share and advocate for UNESCO's vision on using knowledge. UNESCO chairs are laboratories of ideas and of cutting-edge approaches. They contribute to rendering our interventions, interventions more relevant and better informed. So far, for the social and human sciences sector, it has been a great experience to collaborate with UNESCO chairs. Our greatest success story is the Use as Researchers program, who would not have been possible without the UNESCO chair with whom we co-designed, we co-implemented and we co-evaluated impactful global, regional and national projects. From Dr. Pak Dolan at the University of Galway, who invented the Youth as Researchers concept, to Dr. Mark Brennan at the Penn State University and Dr. Rajesh Tandon from the Society for Participatory Research in Asia, who have provided significant in-kind support for the rollout of these projects. I would also like to mention a few other chairs with whom we are working very closely. UNESCO chairs on future literacy, on artificial intelligence, Dr. John Shawe Tyler from the University College London, and on the Mentalities Initiative, Dr. Bhavani Rao from Amrita University. From the exchanges that our ADG um, had with UNESCO chairs yesterday and today, it is clear that there is a huge scope to improve our joint work. We need a future UNESCO Chairs program that will promote, monitor, and reward collaboration, co-design, and co-delivery between UNESCO Chairs and UNESCO. In view of ongoing and emerging trends, we also need a future Chairs program that fosters transdisciplinarity. In the parallel session that we hosted this morning, it was mentioned several times that our world cannot continue facing challenges in silos. Without transdisciplinarity in research, we do not have the evidence and knowledge necessary to support transdisciplinarity in policy or in development actions. Finally, it is important that UNESCO chairs help democratize knowledge in a very, very rigorous way. Rigorous scholar research is crucial and needs to be supported and accessed by all. The chairs program must provide opportunities for youth in their diversity, in all their diversity, to build capacity and engage in academic research. At the same time, non-scholar approaches, inclusive and participatory methods that allow to voice the knowledge, ideas, and experiences, and I would like to add solutions, of different population groups, particularly youth, are equally important. 
we need a UNESCO chairs program that embraces this dual need that would connect with UNESCO initiatives. On our side, as social and human sciences sectors, sector, we commit to continue working with the chair in a very, very collaborative way, and we are willing to advance these priorities through our work. Our central target is promoting inclusive development. So we have the revamped MOST program, which is the, um, the program for the management of social transformations. We are working um, together with experts in the, the framework of the Inclusive Policy Lab. We also have the recommendation on the ethics of AI. We work in the field of youth, in the field of sport. And of course, we have um, one of our priorities is the fight against racism and discrimination. We hope that those two days will bring us in the path that would encourage all of us to work in a very collaborative way in the future. You inspire us in our efforts, and we will be calling on you. Thank you. May I, Stefania? You know, actually, I have a problem, but uh, I will tell you later. You know, uh, so uh, there are actually two Category 2 centers in, in Ocean Affairs, or two and a half, because in some of them is, di is divided, and 18 uh, chairs uh, related to the ocean. So, you know, uh, but uh, we participated uh, in a workshop focused on the ocean in a small room. So uh, I came out infected. But I was not infected by COVID. I was infected by the enthusiasm. It should, you know, it was the atmosphere was wonderful. I really thank everyone for participating. <laughs> so, you know, uh, ocean is coming back to us, and we are coming back to the ocean. You know, Homo sapiens became a terrestrial species. But you know, we live on the planet in which 70 percent well, I, I hate this, actually. Everyone knows that. But probably not everyone knows that 50% of oxygen that we are now breathing is coming from the ocean. More than 50%. It's not only trees. So that is the role of the ocean, to save us from the climate change by consuming more than 90% of heat, uh, to, con to basically absorb a third of emissions of carbon. So it's a huge role. And because of that, we decided um, together with uh, people who participate in the workshop to really take advantage of many things that are happening. First of all, we work with Stefania in a very uh, productive way, and we are trying to help you to, to move forward with the education for sustainable development. Part of that education will be related to the ocean. And uh, ocean is huge, and ocean uh, agenda is huge. The workshop was called Ocean Sciences, but not, not really Ocean Sciences only. This is also a uh, circular economy. This is also justice. This is uh, fisheries. This is uh, the whole set of activities that, that are dependent on the ocean, using the ocean. And you know, we need to use that potential because ocean has a capacity actually to solve uh, our climate dilemma um, by uh, basically changing uh, the, the capacity of, of uh, uh, protect climate. And we are going to discuss next week in Sharm el-Sheikh at the COP27 of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Ocean has huge capacity to maintain life uh, in, in the world, uh, huge capacity to develop economy that may actually increase in size 10, uh, 10 times in order of magnitude, but also very importantly, we are divided on land, but uh, ocean actually unites us. And uh, because of that, IUC proposed to United Nations a decade of ocean science for sustainable development. And people agree now that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to capitalize on the goodwill of people and actually uh, create the ocean we need for the just and sustainable future that we want. How to do it? Uh, I think, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a physical scientist, you know, but, you know, and I wanted uh, actually participated in many uh, discussions on why climate is changing, why ocean is moving in that uh, direction. But, you know, all boils, uh, boils down to us people, to how we act. 
We need to change people. And ocean has that huge capacity to change people. People are getting better. And the wonderful atmosphere in the group simply means that, you know, we have wonderful people working for the good cause. This is also a, a chance for us to work for peace on this planet. So with that, I think there was a strong resolution of the uh, whole society there. And people actually liked uh, each other to form a unit twin network focusing on the ocean. And this is not kind of an order that is going to be uh, top down and people will start working. Uh, this is a bottom up initiative. So um, people already have their uh, email addresses. They have good uh, ideas. They're going to create uh, a network. They're going to uh, create also some rules of procedures, some goals. So, and you know, we will not be controlling them. We'll be helping them. And I think they will just create a, a fantastic environment in which we used to work in the uh, Environmental Oceanographic Commission. But I have to say, education was to some, somehow a little bit overlooked in the, in the work of IOC because we have uh, so, so much to do. And now we are focusing on ocean literacy. We also need to focus on education that is also specialized in education because ocean science is a very complicated science. But in the end, this is not just technical science, but the science that brings together exact sciences, social sciences, and goodwill. So be ready. Very soon there will be a unit twin network focusing on the ocean matters that will be very active, very enthusiastic, and join the network. And uh, let's just once again move to the version we need for the future we want. Thank you. Thank you, Vladimir. Merci. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, chers collègues. Voilà. Thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues. You saw the wealth of uh, topics that were mentioned. Thank you for the thoughts for the future. And also, uh, there's been a presentation of all of the work that we're going to do together on biodiversity, climate change, education, and culture, and the contribution of the chairs to Mondiocult, to this uh, major summit uh, this year. Uh, organized this year, and uh, also the questions uh, related to di digital transformation and uh, the various consequences of this. Uh, oceans, uh, of course, uh, we concluded uh, with the uh, uh, great uh, oceans uh, as presented by Vladimir. And of course, there's also the priority Africa, which is a topic on which we all work together to uh, uh, engage with Africa. Uh, on this point. We have uh, now reached uh, the end of this session. Uh, for the next steps, if you agree, just to wrap up a little bit, my colleagues are great, uh, uh, you know, inspiring points. I think we, we, we all agree that this is a very powerful asset of the house. Uh, a very true intersectorial uh, program, a visionary 30 years ago, and it has the power to be and, uh, and uh, the potential to be the, the next visionary revamp program for UNESCO. So, if you agree, I propose that we have to focus on three dimensions, to leverage and to strengthen the power of the intellectual leadership of this uh, program, in order to help UNESCO to co-design the agenda for the next few years. You know that we have uh, what we call technically, bureaucratically speaking, the C5, which is our common agenda at UNESCO. And uh, the contribution uh, from an intellectual leadership side of the chairs is absolutely crucial. So this is the first point. The second point, to leverage the power of networking. I think all the, the program, all the, the, the initiative you mentioned from social sciences to science to culture to CI to uh, ocean uh, and uh, international uh, external relations are very much about the power of networking within countries and across the borders. So there are some good models, France, Italy. I do believe that other countries can really do the best to reinforce their own constituency and uh, uh, bring, bridge in with other, uh, with other chairs, uh, uh, national and regional networking. Third, and it's not the last but not the least, to leverage the power of innovation. This is very much a DNA of universities. This is very much uh, all of us as researchers, uh, you know, professors are supposed to do. We usually do in our daily work. But if we put it together, we, we create a critical mass that from co-designing to co-creating uh, to really innovating and 
the keyword transform. You know that the transformation is our, uh, not only in education, but through education, sorry, I put education everywhere, but it is my job description, so I have to do that. But it's really very much what we can do to contribute to the UN and to reinforce uh, multilateralism in these troubled times. So I think uh, we can do that. We can co-sign, if you agree, a new compact for the next phase, maybe the 30 years ahead, for a, a reinforced uh, um, co-chair unit twin program. And thank you. Thank you very much for coming and for giving us, uh, as you said, Vladimir, contamination. It's around the contamination from, from the virus, but for this enthusiastic, positive energy we, we, we felt in this room. Thank you very much, and thanks, colleagues, for your time. Really. What's happening now? Last. Thank you very much, uh, Stefania Giannini and all the colleagues, ADGs and their colleagues from, from all the sectors. We are really reaching the end of the, um, the, uh, the two days of conference. Um, some of you, perhaps like myself, may be in a little bit uh, of a state of caffeine deficiency. Um, we did have, just to announce a little change in program, uh, we did have, you will have seen on the program, um, that we were to have a, a final address, which was an external view on uh, the UNESCO Chair's Unit Twin program by one of the key sociologists in, in France, uh, Michel Vivorca. Je vais juste dire un mot en and I would just like to say a few words in French on this point. He wanted to uh, tell us uh, about uh, maintaining our heading in a, a very tumultuous uh, world and transformation of uh, knowledge in a, a difficult time. But unfortunately, he's ill and he could not join us today. But uh, we are going to share what he has uh, written uh, with the uh, uh, re report of the conference. Uh, he's a sociologist and he's a, a director of studies at the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris. He was uh, the uh, president of the International Sociological Association. He was a member of the scientific board of the European Research Council. He also chaired the foundation Maison des Sciences de l'Homme for a period of more than 10 years. And he's working on uh, uh, cultural and social issues, diversity, violence, uh, how to end violence, uh, discrimination, racism, anti-Semitism, and terrorism. And uh, uh, I think that uh, his point of view is very useful for us. Years ago, but part of his intervention, and you will see it in the text, is to say the world's context has also changed since the early 90s, and what are the implications for research researchers in general and, and for the program um, in particular. So unfortunately, he's not with us, and we wish him um, swift recovery, but his text will be shared as part of uh, the report. Um, Perhaps just before closing, because this is our last chance together and we have a little bit of time, I would like to open if anyone very freely would like to, this is our last chance to, in this gathering, um, any final thoughts on these two days, any reactions, any simply uh, an idea, something you would like to share 
around these two days uh, that we have had together. Just before we move to closing remarks from the French National Commission and my final remarks attempting to, to connect some of the dots since yesterday morning until, until today. So just open up if anyone would like to come in. Yes, that's microphone, just. Thank you, Sobi. Just to, to say in spirit and in sentiment that is the best UNESCO, this one. It's UNESCO, it's UNESCO that we all want. UNESCO that promotes the reflection, that promotes ideas, that promotes the thinking, and no one else in the world, no one else can do what we, have to, what we are doing here at UNESCO. So we have to be very grateful to UNESCO, the possibility of having this forum to debate on ideas and proposal and to move forward. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, my name is Zil Falil from Malaysia. I'm the UNESCO Chair on Human Genetics. I've noticed that uh, uh, there's lack of discussion on life sciences uh, over the last two days. Uh, I get the feeling that perhaps I'm the only chair uh, on life sciences. I may be wrong. I, I'm hoping I'm wrong. Uh, is there any... Uh, I hope there are other chairs on life sciences and perhaps maybe there is an opportunity uh, to have more discussion on life sciences. So, thank you for that. Um, f f life sciences f far removed from my immediate uh, uh, area of work, but I, 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 I would hope and I would guess that um, uh, there are chairs working on areas increasingly that intersect, and I think that's how we want to move forward. Uh, we mentioned earlier a platform and an updated uh, database, because that would also help uh, to connect, to see what people are working on, what colleagues are working on, and find these intersections uh, between our, our, our different areas of focus and areas of work. Yes, please. From just using the microphone. Yeah. Uh, I, I will stand, so. Then you need to lift the microphone <laughs> so that. Yeah, yeah uh, okay, I'm getting some help. Uh, it, it is a wonderful pleasure to be here. Thank you so much to uh, UNESCO for organizing this um, event. I am aware that UNESCO is about culture uh, uh, as well as uh, what we think of education in a conventional sense. So I am here as a scholar and also as an artist and also as someone who has knowledge that is sometimes described as indigenous, but this is one of our ways of learning. So I want to share this music right now in honor of the ancestors who have found their own ways of creating, transmitting, and protecting knowledge. And also to inform those of you who don't know that this instrument called Mbira from my home country of Zimbabwe and uh, Malawi. It was a joint inscription into UNESCO's uh, list of cultural, uh, intangible cultural heritages. So I'm going to play a piece of this music as it is always played in the tradition of my family in a gathering to celebrate all of us in spirit. And now I can go up to stage. <laughs> I hope these mics work. Uh, I am Ganyama Tobed Zapasi, by the way. Tune that a little bit.
Wir können. Thank you for bringing in, after two days of intense uh, intellectual, cognitive uh, exchange, uh, a personal touch, a creative touch. Uh, appreciate that. I would now like to call up um, uh, Susie Halimi from the uh, National French Commission just for some words of um, some final concluding remarks. And then I will come in and just uh, try, as I said, to pick up on some of the main ideas that, that I, I have heard, I think we have been um, discussing over, over the two days before we close. Mesdames, Messieurs. Ladies and uh, uh, gentlemen, dear students, because there are a few students in the audience, we're coming to uh, the end of two days of uh, fruitful thinking, fruitful exchanges, rich of ideas and uh, projects that we will take uh, with us and we'll try as best we can uh, to uh, to implement. So uh, how to uh, sum up after two days of extensive talks, not an easy task, but I was asked to try anyway. So by way of conclusion, what can I say? Well, the first thing I would say is thank you. I would like to say thank you to the small team that uh, organized these uh, two days. Uh, thanks to Alexander, to Inga, whom I do not see, uh, thanks to Isabel, and uh, thanks to Maya. Uh, I'm calling them by their first names, but um, having spent so many days with them in uh, preparation uh, meetings, they're not part, as it were, of my extended family. I should like to thank all the chairs that have uh, rallied round that have come to share their enthusiasm, to share with us their projects and activities. Many thanks to uh, Stefania Giannini, who has uh, uh, supported us all along on all activities related to education, and indeed uh, her uh, entire staff covering all scientific disciplines where our chairs are involved. Before you, they were able to renew their commitment their determination to serve the uh, UNESCO Chairs Program. And so many thanks to you all. And uh, those that I uh, failed to mention, please forgive me. I try and uh, shy away from uh, individual thanks because inevitably you get it wrong. In any case, uh, having said these few words of thanks, what can I say by way of conclusion? But my personal way of uh, uh, of concluding symposia and, uh, and, and meetings of this kind is by formulating recommendations. Well, we've heard uh, a number of recommendations already, but it is, uh, well, when you uh, repeat such recommendations, uh, you drive the, the message home in a way. So uh, looking at uh, the UNESCO uh, Chairs Program, uh, uh, what recommendations can we uh, can we make? Well, the first thing we could recommend is, in fact, to urge them to continue uh, their work with the same enthusiasm. It is also for us to uh, urge them to uh, practice cooperation, because what I found uh, quite striking in most uh, presentations, but even starting with Professor Membe's uh, lecture, uh, uh, we uh, have a resurgence of the prefix inter, international, interdisciplinary, uh, uh, intergenerational. Uh, now, how, how can you say it uh, more properly? In just in a few letters, that little prefix inter says it all. Uh, that is what our chairs are all about, cooperation 
and so uh, what is recommended here is for them to work uh, jointly, to work together, but also to work with the national commissions, uh, whom I would also like to thank, by the way, at least uh, all uh, uh, of those who uh, were present today, but also uh, to work with UNESCO institutes because our chairs uh, would uh, gain a lot from working with IIPE. Uh, that is uh, the institute that uh, trains um, education executives, but UIL, uh, which is in charge of lifelong learning. And so it is uh, the best illustration of uh, a lifelong education. And, and that is, of course, what our, our chairs are, are engaged in as well. And so many thanks to the chairs and continue the good work. But also a few words by way of recommendation to the, uh, the institutions that host them, universities and schools of higher education. What should be uh, put forward is uh, the role of chairs when uh, your institutions uh, work out their strategic plans because your chairs are there to promote international relations and they really should be brought to the fore. Um, and another thing I would like to say to these uh, uh, institutions uh, uh, of higher education, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there are more and more women in your uh, uh, institutions, in your schools of higher education, and indeed in the governing bodies, uh, the boards, you have uh, uh, chair men that are chair women, and of course, uh, they, they also have their rightful place in the UNESCO Chairs Program. Um, well, there are quite a few women already engaged in doing uh, fine work, but uh, I would like to uh, tip my hat off to, to them uh, because uh, it is uh, excellent that uh, women should uh, be just as involved as men in the work of the chairs. But um, so, of course, uh, when it comes to uh, gender, make sure that uh, women should have uh, all their rights, but also make sure that the chairs have uh, all the wherewithal. Uh, they should have the premises, the offices, the staff, the, uh, the financial resources as well, because, uh, of course, for chairs to work, they need uh, resources. Even uh, your contacts, your partnerships will make all the difference. When a chair is uh, created or renewed, uh, you should, of course, provide a, a letter of recommendation, a letter of support, but that uh, usually is a very generous gesture that can help promote uh, a project. Indeed, uh, these uh, projects uh, take place within your own walls. Now, recommendations for the national commissions, there were many of them uh, today, indeed, this morning there was a special session bringing together the national commissions and what was advocated uh, is uh, reinforced cooperation amongst national commissions. But, of course, recommendations do not end there. Uh, of course, uh, again, uh, it is for national commissions to uh, support chairs when uh, drafting a, a project, when preparing an application. And, indeed, that is the very role of national commissions. Uh, uh, try and strike the right balance, uh, a, a better distribution uh, in uh, themes, a better geographic uh, distribution as well. And also inform your chairs of uh, all UNESCO activities. Uh, you should encourage uh, chairs to become uh, involved, to attend uh, major conferences uh, especially at this uh, time, chairs uh, have been shown to uh, to make a, a very useful contribution to, uh, well, the World Conference on Higher Education was the case in point, but in a few days' time, uh, they will be involved uh, in uh, the World Conference on Childhood, and, uh, and indeed, and indeed, there were many of them uh, today. So, again, uh, many thanks to these uh, institutions of higher education and many thanks to the uh, National Commissions for their support. Now, another word of thanks to member states themselves. Um, member states, well, what, what advice could we give? 
Well, uh, the f obvious thing is to uh, support the UNESCO Chairs Program whenever uh, uh, possible, and that means, uh, well, when there are uh, meetings of the executive board or, uh, uh, of course, uh, during the, the general conference, uh, and by the way, one is coming up. So um, uh, definitely do uh, uh, your best to uh, support the uh, the. Uh, the, uh, the UNESCO Chairs Program. But as member states, it is also for well, for you to provide some sort of financial support, sponsorships, uh, uh, scholarships for, uh, for the younger uh, students, even for less young students, uh, extending uh, student visas or visiting visas for uh, visiting professors traveling around. This sort of thing can make a difference. Member states do have a significant role to play when it comes uh, to uh, uh, promoting uh, the, uh, the, the work of uh, UNESCO chairs. And, uh, of course, uh, I shall not uh, dwell on this for too long because this, uh, uh, this uh, session is coming to a close, but one final recommendation to UNESCO itself. Uh, and that recommendation would be for uh, UNESCO better to use uh, this uh, great repository of experts, the expertise uh, uh, accumulated uh, in, in UNESCO chairs, because uh, in all your work when it comes to uh, drafting reports, to uh, taking stock, the, the expertise is right there. Uh, at your uh, uh, at your disposal, and so make use of this, and make sure that information about your activities uh, is properly available and disseminated. And indeed, then I'm turning to all of you who expressed the wish that UNESCO should set up a global observatory of uh, UNESCO chess, because that observatory uh, uh, would compile, as it were, uh, information about best practices, but then also disseminate these best practices. Again, that is uh, typically UNESCO's role, to collect data and disseminate self-same data, and that is what an observatory is all about. Now, this brings me to the close of these closing remarks, uh, which uh, I try to keep as short as possible. But again, by way of conclusion, let me quote from uh, Professor Ashin Mbembe. Uh, he quote himself uh, quoted Edgar Morin, and my thoughts go out to uh, the late Edgar Morin. For the future, we uh, need to take a new path. We need to uh, change our lives. We've talked about the future of UNESCO chairs, for the chairs themselves, but also everything surrounding them. New path, new lives. And uh, I'm not sure it was Professor Mbembe who said this, but uh, whatever he said, I really liked what he said. Uh, when you return to your uh, respective homes and countries and institutions, I would like uh, to wish you from the uh, bottom of my heart this felicity we mentioned, the harmony with self and others. Thank you to you all. Yes. Well, thank you, uh, Susie Halimi, uh, for uh, on behalf of the French National Commissions, you uh, spoke here the concluding uh, remarks and uh, known of listening. Um, I hope over the two days that you have um, that you have really had the opportunity to meet, to exchange, uh, and, uh, and to dialogue, to meet uh, new uh, colleagues and new persons. Um, and I hope that you will have some time just after the closing. Hope that you are all not rushing uh, uh, back to travel and that you will have still some time uh, just after the end of this to, to continue some of the conversations. I wanted just to share five 
thoughts from the last two days. And the first is about our moment. Our moment is, and that prompted the conference, marking 30 years of uh, 30th anniversary uh, of the program. But as I mentioned in reference quickly to Michel Vivorca's intended uh, intervention, that was 1992, we're in 2022, and the context has changed. And we have heard, and in, in, not only in this conference, in many venues, that we are at a critical historical juncture. The reference to the UN Secretary's Our Common Agenda frames it as a choice between breakdown or breakthrough. Um, we heard this morning also about the critical insecurity in the present and as we project into the future, that futures are increasingly uncertain and complex and, uh, and that we need to radically change course. And in looking at the future, it's, it's possibly reparative, uh, reparative, uh, reparative futures uh, given the violence of human activity on the environment, but given also the violence of multiple forms of exclusion, social, cultural, economic, uh, and, uh, and otherwise. So first is the, the moment, the, the urgency of the moment. Second is around knowledge and knowledge as a common good. And that knowledge is at the heart of our efforts to forge just, more just and sustainable futures. And I think we'd heard that knowledge is essential to how we understand the world, how we give meaning, it is also what prompts, uh, guides, inspires um, our actions. But we also heard from day one and from the keynote address yesterday morning that existing understandings of knowledge, ways of generating and distributing knowledge are, are no longer sufficient and are even part of the problem, are no longer sufficient to respond to uh, the multiple intersecting, uh, overlapping crises. Um, <clears throat> Part of that is to recognize the need for all the knowledges. Uh, as Sheila Mbembe referred to this using the term, the, les archives du monde. We need all sources of knowledge and we also need to reaffirm knowledge as part, uh, of, uh, uh, as part of the global commons, uh, uh, knowledge that needs to be open, public, free, protected from enclosures. So knowledge as a common good. Third thought, collective intelligence, but collective, intelli collective intelligence that is represented through this network, unique network, but collective intelligence for collective action. And that w thinking, analysis, research must translate into action and action, and, and that has given the urgency of our moment, that has implications for the type, uh, the way in which uh, we generate uh, knowledge and undertake uh, research. So we heard about more multidimensional research responses, more participative action research. Um, and this brings us also to how we work together. And so a fourth idea that I take away is breaking silos and, and building bridges. One one simple idea in the chairs network is we have often referred to chairs in terms of their chair holders, as if it's one or several persons. It, a chair is a team. A chair is also the students that work with 
the chairholders and the members of their team. So we need, we need to build those bridges uh, between uh, teaching research staff and, and students. We need to build the bridges across chairs, across the, uh, the, the disciplinary silos. Uh, uh, we did uh, discuss quite a bit on transdisciplinarity. Across sectors, across sectors within UNESCO. Um, and this conference would have not been possible if the colleagues from all UNESCO sectors came together um, to help design uh, and organize this, this unique uh, opportunity. It's also building bridges beyond academia and engaging with the community. It's uh, building bridges not only north and south, but strengthening the south-south also um, uh, uh, cooperations. So breaking silos and building bridges, collective intelligence for collective action, knowledge as a common good, all this in response to our moment, which is a critical moment. But we can end on the fifth note of hope. Um, we heard, I think, from Federico Mayor yesterday, the dare to hope and that we have the privilege, all of us, individually and collectively, we're not in survival mode. We have the privilege and we have a collective responsibility. And there is hope when we see the commitment, when we see the dynamism, um, the uh, different, uh, we heard some of the experiences and, and, and the mobilizations that are happening almost spontaneously. And there is hope in that uh, spirit. And that spirit must be based on trust, on respect, on humility. Um, something that we also heard strongly from day one in the way we deal with each other and our diversity of ways of being, of knowing, and of uh, giving meaning uh, to, the, to, to the world. So those were my five takeaways from the last two days, but really a last word to thank everyone, to thank all the UNESCO chairs for all the different, the multiple ways that you contribute to UNESCO work, knowledge generation, to the normative work, to the capacity strengthening work, uh, to, uh, 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 and across the range of um, across the range of areas of uh, of our mandates and the strategic uh, priorities, obviously a uh, big thanks to the national commissions, and we heard that, and and this was an excellent example in partnership with the French national commission, uh, a key role for the national commission to also support and. Um, uh, and, and, and contribute to what is a collective effort uh, in, um, in this program and in what really UNESCO is. It is um, multiple constituencies uh, needing to uh, come together. All the sectors, all the national commissions, um, all the chairs and their constituencies. Breaking the silos is also, it's uh, breaking or um, uh, bridging uh, the institutional, the academic institutions with the multitude of their partners. And this is the spirit of a new social contract of bringing in all stakeholders uh, involved uh, in education as, as, as chairs, but also in all the actions undertaken by the various chairs that you represent in your areas of, um, of expertise and of and of action. So thank you very much to all. Um, I really do hope that you have some more time, uh, less listening time and more exchange time um, just after the closing, that you, for those of you from who, most of you who are from outside Paris to enjoy um, uh, being together um, in, uh, in Paris uh, for the time that remains. And uh, we do look forward to engaging in 
uh, in different ways uh, in the future. Thank you to all the colleagues. And a last word, really a thank you to my uh, small team, um, but a small team that does miracles, uh, I have to say. Um, uh, Susie Halimi mentioned some of them. I wouldn't want to mention all of them, but they are um, all really behind uh, uh, wonderful human beings, persons, uh, and excellent colleagues uh, that allow us to do um, uh, the, the things that we are doing. So thank you, everyone.